Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the astrological forecast for the entire month of May of 2023. Joining me today are astrologers Austin Kopic and Claire Moon. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Hello, hello. All right, so I'm going to do a brief little introduction showing you an overview of some of the astrology of the month. And then we're going to do a discussion for probably about 45 minutes to an hour looking at a retrospective of some major astrology stories from the past month of, of the past few weeks since our last forecast. And then after that, about halfway through the episode, we'll jump into the astrology of May. So you can use, as always, the timestamps in the description below this video or on the podcast website to jump forward to different parts of the episodes if you would like. Uh, but otherwise, let's go ahead and jump right into the forecast. So for the video viewers, here's our planetary alignments calendar, which shows the major astrological alignments that are going to happen during the month of May of 2023. We start off the month right at the very top with the outer planet Pluto stationing retrograde in Aquarius for the very first time since its ingress a few weeks ago um, on May 1st. And on the same day, there is a Mercury-Sun conjunction marking the halfway point through the Mercury retrograde cycle. Then a few days later, we get our first lunation of the month, which is actually a lunar eclipse in the sign of Scorpio on May 5th, and that is the second and final eclipse of our current eclipse season, which began uh, a couple of weeks before that. Then two days later, Venus moves into the sign of Cancer on the 7th of May. Then the Sun conjoins Uranus on the 9th, Mercury stations direct and ends its three-week retrograde period on the 14th. Jupiter departs from Aries and moves into the sign of Taurus, uh, on the 16th of May, and then immediately after that squares Pluto in early, early Aquarius on the 17th. Then we get our second lunation of the month, which is a new moon in the sign of Taurus on the 19th. And the following day, Mars ingresses into the sign of Leo, departing from Cancer, and then immediately opposes Pluto in Aquarius. On the 21st, the sun moves into Gemini, and Gemini season begins. And then two days later, Mars squares uh, Jupiter, and we get one of our last major alignments or aspects of the month. So there's some other details that we'll get into during the course of this episode, but that's kind of the big, broad outline of what we're going to be talking about later in the forecast episode. All right. So, hey, welcome, both of you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so hey, much for Chris. having me. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. So this is your first time joining us for a forecast episode, but you've appeared on the podcast at least twice before. One of them one of our audience members just mentioned one of your first appearances was on the Becoming a Professional Astrologer episode, and we were remarking about that we can't believe that was almost two years ago now, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been a while, but that was great. Yeah, and you're I know that you're you're thriving and still doing good in your practice of astrology and then mm -hmm. getting out there and doing doing good work. Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, a slow and steady little plodding along, speaking of Taurus season. Um, and, and yeah, I'm doing great. Just doing consults and loving my life. Definitely thriving. Awesome. Keep it up. All right. And Austin, how are you doing? How is how's April treating you? Oh, pretty good. I don't know. It went by in a blur. Um, I've been really busy. I'm, I'm always kind of really busy. But I, I think that if I measured and weighed it. I was busier in April. Um, I was getting um, my year two and three yearly classes um, up and going. And so that takes some some lifting and, and grunting and arrangement. Um, you know, chugging away on faces, chugging away on some other projects, getting ready for Norwalk, um, watching what's going on in the world, <laughs> occasionally making sense of it. Occasionally, as we all, yeah, as we all struggle to do. Uh, yeah, so there's so much going on in the world. Um, there's been, in terms of astrology, though, and, and in terms of like news stories directly related to astrology, which is always what I try to focus on in this segment, um, there's actually been some really interesting ones and some really interesting recent um, astrology and the news stories. So one of them I wanted to mention and talk about is there was a new text of the work of the second century astrologer Claudius Ptolemy that has been um, rediscovered recently, and it was just announced recently over the past couple of months in a, in a paper, and it sort of like hit the news recently. And this is really fascinating because what it is is um, in the Middle Ages, there was some there was a text basically that um, some monks where there was a book of Ptolemy's that had been written in Greek. 
and a monk basically because paper was so um, rare uh, during that time period and so expensive, instead of writing on a new piece of paper, he said it was sort of just like erased over or wrote over this old text of Ptolemy's. And as a result of that, recently, researchers have rediscovered it and used x-rays in order to actually see the writing underneath that um, that text. And they were actually surprisingly able to recover the actual text of this lost work of Ptolemy's that otherwise didn't survive. Um, so here's a like a picture, I think, of the text itself and like what that looked like. And you can see the writing that's on top. But for over a century now, um, scholars have noticed that there's Greek writing underneath that and they've wanted to recover it. But um, some of the efforts to actually one of them involved using like a chemical solution like a century ago, and that actually made it worse uh, and made it like more illegible. So somebody messed that up. But now to do advances in technology, they were able to do x-rays and then they could clearly mm. see the writing underneath the text wow. um, and eventually to draw it out and see that it's like full sentences in Greek. Once they did that, um, one of the researchers, especially a scholar named Alexander Jones, who's done a lot of really good work on the history of astronomy and astrology, recognized that it was actually a text of Ptolemy that we'd seen allusions to that was describing an astronomical instrument similar to an astrolabe that's used in or that was used in order to make um, observations and calculations of astronomical positions, including determining the position of certain planets potentially in the zodiac. So for the video viewers, this is what um, that instrument looks like roughly. And you can see it's kind of similar almost to to the function of an astrolabe or like an early version of something like that is yeah, this like coming or or something yeah exactly so that was really cool because literally that was just like a wa a lost work of ptolemy's that we were never going to see or, or recover or know hardly anything about and all of a sudden they've recovered I think large parts of it or the majority of it so that that device can be reconstructed. And that gives me a lot of hope that there may be other discoveries. And in fact, um, I've started doing some, some research and looking through other papers that Alex, Alexander Jones had published recently. And I discovered one that he published just in the past year or two that had been kind of overlooked that was another major archaeological find related to astrology. And what this was is him and a couple of other researchers wrote a paper saying that they had discovered the um a, a tombstone from Egypt um that was the tombstone of a woman from the second or third century in Egypt and it has an image of her like a picture of her that's inscribed on this um, tombstone essentially but then below it in Greek there's a sentence describing her and it says that her name was Heliodora um, and it says that she was uh, a mathematica which means like a mathematician but in that time period in the second and third century mathematician was the word that astrologers always used to describe their science because there were so many calculations involved in calculating birth charts by hand that um, astrology and astrologers were commonly referred to that as that as mathematicians essentially so what this discovery meant is this is actually the earliest woman that we know of by name who was a practicing astrologer and she lived in Egypt she lived to be about 52 years old apparently is what the description says and she seems to have devoted her life to that subject of of astrology and the mathematical arts um so this is really amazing because I had previously done a study on on this in previous episodes of the podcast as well as in my book where I pointed out um up until recently, the earliest person we knew of that was a woman that would have had some astrological training would have been Hypatia, um, who lived a little bit later in the 5th century. And then after that, the earliest figure that we know of would have been probably Queen Baron, who I did an entire episode on, who lived in Baghdad in the 9th century. But this pushes the date forward and gives us a definite name of the earliest woman that we know of living in Egypt at the same time, roughly, as Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemy, and Vadius Valens, and some of those other authors. So it's really, really interesting and really kind of mind-blowing that the, there's new things being discovered in archaeology, you know, pretty frequently that are telling us new things about the history of astrology. 
That's super cool. That's really yeah. good. So it's it's going to be that it's going to be the pentabiblos now rather than the tetrabiblos. Yeah, maybe like he or threw the in right. Um, Pen he penta threw in penta is the one. Latin, right? The, penta. The, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, or, or Greek, but so. Yeah, so Ptolemy, I'm hoping that at some point we'll like find archaeologists will find the lost works of like Nechepso and Petasiris or um other texts that we only have little fragments of, like the lost text of Hermes that was like one of the earliest texts on the 12 houses and different things like that. Um, and it's kind of exciting. That's what I talked to um my last guest about, Ian Moyer, where I just released the episode on Egyptian astrology. And we talked a lot about how archaeological finds in um, the Egyptian language are still changing what we know about the history of astrology. Um, and I know we also talked about the Deccans, which I know is something you're working on, your book on that right now, right, Austin? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, eavesdropping on y'all's conversation. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, let's see. Any other points about that? Oh, yeah. People can find out more about Heliodora just Google the the title of the paper, which is the Funerary Stel Stella of Heliodora Astrologer, um, and you'll find out more information about that. Or you can search for the paper that outlines the new treatise that was discovered about Ptolemy on uh, by searching the phrase Ptolemy's treatise on the metroscope re recovered, and you'll find uh, more information about that. Um, yeah, it's just it's important things like that also because it's um clarifying things that we already knew. Like we already knew that women were using astrology and practicing astrology. And actually recently some texts have been discovered just in the past few years from Demotic Egyptian, which are now the some of the earliest horoscopes that survive from the first half of the first century BCE. And I actually noted that the three named clients that those horoscopes were for is they were all three for for women basically in the ancient world who were getting their charts cast um, and then delineated by some of these Egyptian priests where one of their functions or one of the types of divination that they were using was astrology. So it's like we knew as women were using astrology as clients, we knew they were probably learning it and becoming astrologers themselves. But due to just the transmission of texts and everything that happened in the medieval period, we had little documentary evidence until um, things like this now. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So other news, other things that are going on in terms of like contemporary events, there's a ton of stuff. I continue and I keep mentioning this every month because it's moving so fast. But some of the things with just the explosion of things that are happening with AI, um, both in terms of the broader things, in terms of um, discussions about AI in general, and there have been some um, calls for oversight and regulation of AI over the past month, which I think is bringing up some of the themes we talked about in the year ahead forecast that we were anticipating in terms of Pluto going into Aquarius and sometimes bringing up fears surrounding some of the archetypes involved in that sign. And one of the things that we mentioned was um, fear of technology. And I think that's kind of interesting because on the one hand, while sometimes those fears can be exaggerated, in other times those fears can actually be legitimate. There can be actual legitimate issues or, or legitimate threats that come up. And that was um, one of the other interesting numbers that's come out over the last um, month or two is that something like, uh, I don't know, like they, they did a poll and in terms of AI researchers, it was like something like 50% thought that um, there was a 10% chance that the development of, of AI could lead to, uh, or a sentient AI could lead to like major negative repercussions for humanity or something like that. Um, so there was actually even fear to some extent, even amongst the researchers where they don't fully know where this is going to go and like what it's going to lead to. And they're aware of some possible downsides but they're still kind of pushing the envelope because of what they think the positive benefits might be for the world or for humanity or, or what have you. You said 10%. I'm kind of surprised it was only 10%. I thought it'd be more yeah. than that. Well, and I'm, I'm not getting that number right. I'll Google that really quickly. Oh, that's, that's but, fine. But well, yeah, everyone's very, seems very nervous about it. 
Well, that's ten percent of the researchers who are oh. working on it, right? Who at least oh, have okay. some fondness for it, if that's their livelihood, yeah, and they understand but it better. <laughs> it is forty-eight percent of respondents said they thought there was a ten percent or greater chance that oh, the effects good. of AI would be extremely bad, extremely, um, yeah, yeah, extremely bad, and also. Yeah, just things like that. So it's like they the 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 worst case scenarios because it's kind of we're kind of like in the stage where they were in the nineteen you know forties where they're developing the atomic bomb, for example. And it's like some of those guys that were developing it, they were like, well, there's some percent chance that we explode one of these things and then it ignites the atmosphere and then destroys all of humanity. But they're like, we don't think that's going to happen, but there's like a chance. And so you kind of have like a similar thing here where they're kind of like developing something where they can see that it has this immense potential and immense, immense power, um, but they also recognize also the the potential like existential threat that it could cause at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard when things are like the black box where we don't quite know how everything works and yet we're trying to move forward with it. So it's a little dicey, but exciting. <laughs> It's a little dicey. So Chris, <laughs> Chris, back to the, like that, uh, back to fear, uh, fear and technology and Pluto and Aquarius. Um, you know, you said, uh, you said, you know, we're, uh, part of that is like looking forward and, you know, seeing, um, the potential for what seems like the potential for catastrophes and then, um, you know, and then be like, oh, but maybe that's just projection or, you know, maybe that's maybe maybe that's just negative thinking. Oh, but maybe it's totally real. Like that's part of I, I think that's the that ambivalent back and forth kind of structure of fear is uh, very much uh, Pluto. It's very signature is that it can't be resolved. Right. Um, because when uh, because Pluto Pluto uh, brings about fear often or more through unknowns than knowns, right? Saturn and Mars can make you afraid, um, like but they they do so by a, often a visible concrete threat, and so the fear gets decided. Like oh, I know that 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 is dangerous. I am afraid. Um, you know, if the tank uh, if a, if a tank rolls up my driveway, I know to be afraid. Right, I'm certain in that fear. Whereas the the Pluto fears, um, and this is you know we're talking about a collective one, but this is part of what Pluto brings by transit on an individual level as well. Um, they're hard to resolve, right? It's the like, am I crazy? Am I just being paranoid? Or you know, am I paranoid? Or are they really out to get me? Right? And um, the the type of circumstances that Pluto brings about don't allow for the resolution of that. So there's an anxiety as well as a fear, right? And what's biologic oh sorry go ahead chris no go ahead oh i was gonna say just like what's biologically interesting about that that's coming up is whether or not the circumstances are favorable or unfavorable even if we're dealing with like a saturn or a mars thing that's unpleasant if you have that certainty it feels better in general versus uncertainty our brains literally squirt out unhappy chemicals certainty whether or not we're right or wrong we squirt out happy chemicals. So that Pluto kind of anxiety with the uncertainty added is just like not great feeling usually. Yeah, it's a special yeah. treat. Yeah, it's special. <laughs> right. Well, and that's because, you know, the, um, and it's, it, you know, if we're looking at the the biology of it, um, your body doesn't know what gear to be in, right? If the tank rolls up the driveway, um, it's time to act. Right. It is definitely not time to calm down. It's time to get the fuck out of the house and then wish I'd put together a to-go bag. Right. Like the the course of action is very clear. Whereas with this, like, I don't know, should I be afraid? Should I calm down? Should I act? If how do I act in relationship to this threat? Is it really a threat? Et cetera. Yeah. That's really interesting because that makes me think of how in the early Hellenistic authors, like in Ptolemy and Valens. Um, the one thing they all have like a wide variety, the ancient astrologers have a wide variety of different like philosophical and religious perspectives. But the one thing that they repeat over and over again as like the purpose or the benefit for doing astrology is to learn about events in the future so that you know what you have to accept um, ahead of time so that you're not completely caught off guard. So maybe for them, part of the purpose of doing astrology was to isolate or to fix that anxiety issue by like having a better sense of knowing. Yeah, stoicism is totally a prescription for low anxiety. It may not help with your depression, but it'll definitely help with the anxiety. 
Sure. Yeah, I've been rereading reading this new translation of Epictetus actually that Rob Bailey pointed to me, and um, it's all about controlling your stoicism is all about like controlling your perception of events and deciding and having the choice or or thinking that free will is an internal component to decide what you're going to classify um as good and bad or or to accept the things that are outside of your control but also to control your perception of things to whatever extent that you can as like the ultimate act of freedom in some way mm -hmm. good yes old stoicism. good old stoicism so going back i just want to clarify the the quote because i just found it it's from a, a vox article um, but it says 48% of respondents said they thought there was a 10% or greater chance that the effects of AI would be extremely bad. And why I wanted to finish the quote was because it's funny, it then puts in parentheses, e.g. human extinction. So what they mean by like, hu like extremely bad is like that one in 10 researchers thinks that like human extinction is, is a possible side effect of developing AI over the course of the next, you know, few decades. Um, and it goes on and it says... It's worth pausing on that for a moment. Nearly half of the smartest people working on AI believe there's a one in 10 chance or greater that their life's work could end up contributing to the annihilation of humanity. Um, so that title, the title of that article is AI experts are increasingly afraid of what they're creating uh, by Kelsey Piper on Vox. So I just wanted to mention that because I thought it was really interesting that that's part of the the zeitgeist right now and that's very descriptive and very like plutonian in terms of that pluto and aquarius mm -hmm. transit that we've just barely dipped our toe into and now this month on may 1st we get the first intensification of with that slowing down and that stationing of pluto which any planetary station is like putting an exclamation mark after a planet and so it'll be interesting to kind of like reflect on that as one of the energies that's sort of about during this time yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, uh, uh, during previous podcasts, I uh, brought up Pluto and its relationship to, um, uh, uh, I should say, the the spectacle of terrifying murder, right? Like with Pluto and Scorpio, the the focal image for that was the lone deviant uh, serial killer like Jeffrey Dahmer, and then during Pluto in Sagittarius, that became uh, school shooters and terrorists. Right. But we, you bring up another side of that, which is what are people, uh, how are people imagining um, like a, a, a terrifying murder, but on a, of humanity, right, on a collective level. And so, because I just rewatched Dr. Strangelove, um, my mind is gone. My mind is, uh, my mind is back with the decades and decades long. Um, sort of ambient fear of total nuclear annihilation during the Cold War. Um, and it just occurs to me that that was uh, the the detonation of the first nuclear device and the, you know, many of the, the hardest parts of the Cold War, as well as the establishment of that nuclear fear, that was all Pluto and Leo. And so um, that we're exactly, we've just entered exactly one half Pluto cycle away from that. Um, and it's not that, how should I say, it's not that no one is worried about, uh, you know, uh, extinction or devastation for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but there's been a lot less of that since the since the the dissolution of the Cold War, right? Some of that sort of imagining the end um, has been clothed in terms of like slow moving, but inexorable environmental catastrophe. Um, but this is the, this is the, I, you know, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong or fill in what I'm missing, but it seems like with AI, this is, um, uh, whether it's possible or not, it's giving people a way to imagine annihilation again for the first time in a while. Yeah. Well, because they're trying to create like some of, they're trying to create a sentient new species that's like smarter, that would automatically be smarter than humanity and also faster than humanity and able to think faster um, than we can just by the limitations of our own biology. And in that way, like some of them frame it as they're almost like creating like a, like a God or something like that. Um, but then you run into the classic issue. Like remember Lisa Scheim pointed out that um, Mary Shelley, the author, the writer who wrote Frankenstein had Pluto 
conjunct the degree of her midheaven in Aquarius. So this is the last time Pluto is in Aquarius. And, and that was one of the things that she became known for is that that idea of like creating this um like a machine or or this like alternative thing, this monster um artificial life that then like gets out of control and like you know ends up killing you or something like that. You've almost got like a similar like kind of archetype in terms of what people are actually thinking about now because there's this race amongst all these companies now to create this thing that would be incredibly powerful if they pull it off, but also um the discussion they're having is about how to align an artificial intelligence, how to align its intentions so that it has the same alignment as humans. Because the problem- well, no, We need to do a lot better than humans. Um, if it has the same motivations as humans, um, right. then right. that's not so good. Let me just add one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, Chris, we've, we've both been reading a lot of Firmicus lately. Um, and one of the things that this reemphasized to me is the- consistent reference to some signs as human or humane signs, um, meaning that they they create things that are, they bring about things that are human shaped, right? And Aquarius being the water bearer is a human sign. And so with, you know, with Pluto there, we're worried about something that resemble, uh, that resembles us. And um, Frankenstein also was humanoid in form. And actually, you know, if you've read Frankenstein um, was tragically um, human in many ways, like people, um, some literary people will call Frankenstein like proto existentialist literature because he's he's just created and alienated from his creator. Um, and he does do a murder, um, but it's more tragic existentialist than slasher film. Uh, but again, you know, we have the the object of horror or whatever um, uh, being human shaped, right? And you know, they're like, what if it can? You know, what if it can do the human things? Um, is the is the the you know the the source of anxiety and fear around the AI projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like we can either have replicators from Star Trek, which would be great, or we can have like gray goo theory. You know, that intersection of like what what happens when we well maybe it already has happened AI with nanotechnology. Um, mm -hmm. But Austin, what you said piqued my interest of like Pluto. If Pluto is annihilation, and then we have Pluto in Leo, which is more of like annihilation from a central point, like a giant bomb. What is it when annihilation comes from the edges? Like, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. uh, in the case of more environmental climate stuff, the edges of our civilization's, you know, reaches in the form of glacial melt coming down. That's coming from the edges for us um, already. Granted, that's longer than Pluto in Aquarius, but um side note, have been hearing like seemingly increasing numbers of stories about that water situation in the last couple Well, and months. that the, mm -hmm. the, um, yeah, I've, I've also just water keeps popping up. That's, uh, it's gotta be Saturn's entry into Pisces. Right. Yeah. So there's just thinking. concern about water. Just one quick note on the bomb, right? Um, so it's, yeah, Pluto, Pluto and Leo, it's a fire sign. It's literally the sun, the, the sun's sign. Um, you know, fission is something that star or that stars do. They also do fusion, but they they do both in different phases. So it's literally an artificial sun destroying everything, whereas um, with the Pluto and Aquarius, an artificial human. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So, um, anyways, but I'm bringing this up again for like yet another month on the podcast, just because things seem to be moving very fast. There's so much happening in that area and it's clearly connected with Pluto and Aquarius. And this is somehow just the start of like the next 20 years and some developments um, that will have like a transformative effect on the world and society during the course of that. So it's very good to pay attention to the the early beginnings of that as it's happening. And yeah, one of the themes that came up this month was just calls for regulation. And even that's coming from even some of the AI companies who are like, we would love to be regulated because they were like, we think this should be regulated because we're dealing with stuff that could have a huge impact on society. But they said up till now, there is no regulation. So everybody is just sort of creating their own rules because it's kind of the wild, wild west. And it's um, an area that hasn't been explored before. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that. On a more um, positive AI news, though, 
Um, one of the things I've been tracking, and I mentioned briefly last month, but it's gotten it exploded even more, is since ever since Saturn went into Pisces, especially, I feel like when Saturn is was in Aquarius, we got the introduction of some of these new technologies, like we were seeing some of the um early image generators last year, and we mentioned those in different episodes. But some of those image generators after Saturn has gotten into Pisces recently over the past month or so have gotten really good. And there's just been this explosion of creativity online of different people using these image generators to generate um, both very creative things, but also very surprisingly like lifelike images as well, which is the part that is startling me is how good they're getting. So um, I've been playing with an image generator called Midjourney, which is one of the main ones. And um, part of it is about learning how to use the language to get the AI to do what you want and what prompts to put into it in order to generate the image that you want to see or something that looks really good. So I borrowed a prompt from somebody that I got online on Twitter, and I asked it to generate a picture of a cat um, that was working as a detective in an office with a hat and a, and a gentlemanly suit. And um, this is what it came up with, was it generated this image in about 15 <laughs> or 20 seconds. Well, um, as I remember, Chris, the prompts were cat working as a detective gentleman style. <laughs> yes, gentleman style, which is very crucial. But this looks like for those listening to the audio version or not watching the video version, you should check out the video version for this. This looks like it was a picture that was taken of a cat in an office with a high definition camera that looks like a real cat, but it's not. This is absolutely um, both not a real cat, but also I can kind of demonstrate that because I have the variations because at first it, it gave me four different variations and it asked which one I liked and it created slightly different variations of the cat with different gentlemanly style hats, um, you know, either a flat hat or more of a top hat. Yeah. Anyways, so that was incredible. And I've just been playing with that and I really encourage people to check it out only because it's a really good and really tangible demonstration of what's going on with the astrology right now with Saturn having gone into Pisces and the start of the buildup to a several year conjunction with Neptune of the Saturn-Neptune conjunction. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more creativity and a lot more um, interesting things like that. Um, so I had it like swap out, like, you know, let's do, instead of a cat, let's do an otter. And it came up with a lifelike otter, like sitting at a table, um, looking like a detective and it's pretty good. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty lifelike. Um, but it can do just like all sorts of different things. I know both of you created some as well, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. We play with it a little bit. All right. What was here i'll show yours claire what was what was yours oh it was uh randy savage in all of his iconic gear uh trying to destroy the one ring at a volcano <laughs> yes so we see randy savage <laughs> uh standing majestically in front of uh mount doom at, at morador <laughs> where he's going on his quest to destroy the one ring <laughs> oh yeah exactly yeah <laughs> I feel like my life is just like 10% more complete. Like I've unlocked some kind of achievement now. I've seen that. I've made it in my mind. Yeah, that was pretty good. And then Austin, you uh, you had a couple. One of them was you said put, you said, let's do Mickey Mouse in the style of H.R. Geiger, who was like mm -hmm. the artist that inspired the, like the artwork for Alien, right? No, he did. He designed everything for Alien. He didn't inspire it. Um, okay. Yeah, he, he has a very signature biomechanical horror style. All right. Well, this is what, for the people watching the video version, this is what what it came up with, what it generated in about like, what, 10 or 15 seconds, which is pretty, pretty good. Yeah, it was, it was no, it's great. The, uh, yeah, the upper left, I think, is the most faithful to Giger. For sure. It definitely looks like Mickey Mouse was in one of the Aliens movies. Yeah. Yeah. They, they found that on a, you know, on some uh, previously, uh, previously undiscovered planet, just a, a strange temple with Mickey there worked into, you know, the strange motifs of the walls. 
That would be yeah. terrifying. I would be way more terrified by that if that's what they <laughs> found on that planet. I was just thinking, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be able to decide whether to run away or whether to go say hi. I'm not sure. Yeah. You're like, he seems friendly enough. And then he, he eats <laughs> the worst face. that happen. <laughs> right. The one, that little like mouth comes out from inside of Mickey's mouth. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. good. Yeah. And yeah. then, yeah. And yeah, it like yeah, the little the little second mouth, and it says, "I'm you know," and then it whispers the the secrets of the creation of humanity into your uh, ear. Pluto and Aquarius, I'm already tired. <laughs> yeah, well, so a lot of fun stuff you can do. I was even doing some architectural stuff. I wanted to try to imagine like the Library of Alexandria, and this is what it come came up with, which I thought was pretty beautiful. Um, so. Anyways, I'm mentioning this and I, for both of you yesterday, I like invited you into mid journey to show you how it works. Cause it's one of those things you have to try out and you have to have a, like an embodied experience of doing it in order to understand what it's about. And until you do that, like it's, it's hard to really see what's going on and understand the implications of it, which are kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, that's going to lead to a huge explosion. It has led to a huge explosion of creativity as well as a, what's interesting is a, a lowering of the barrier to entry where now anybody, even if they don't have, you know, the, the mechanical creative skill as an artist or like, you know, many, many years of training doing digital artwork, they can create something, you know, that was in their head and, and see it realized, which is one of the interesting potentials. Of course, there's also many downsides as well in terms of artists whose um, styles they feel like is being ripped off, ripped off or replicated as well as the loss of many jobs of digital artists that have built their career kind of creating images like this, but now might be replaced. And so there's also some major challenges and other issues coming up as well in terms of both good and bad things. So I don't necessarily, I'm not trying to necessarily pass a value judgment in terms of good or bad, but instead, like we always do kind of documenting something as it's happening in real time, and especially noting the correlations astrologically, because I just think there's something incredibly striking and interesting about that in and of itself. Yeah. So one of the things that um, your your brief uh, tutorial uh, reemphasized to me is the, uh, I guess you'd call it the centaur hypothesis or centaur scenario, um, where I and I, I don't remember where this originated from. I remember reading about it ten years ago. Um, but people thinking about how um, the the uh, uh, increased ability to mechanize things um, or to have computers do more and more labor with the development of AI, um, the sort of reasonable, the non-apocalyptic likely scenario was that the most effective at any given task would not be a human uh, or an AI, but uh, in fact, a human and, and uh, an AI working in tandem and that you would have the benefits of both. And so they they uh, they referred to this as a centaur, right? Like half one thing, half the other, like a biomech, like an HR Giger biomechanical centaur, right? And, right. you know, it was interesting because they, you know, with just a, a because in order to create a, 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 a I should we say, an interesting, striking, humorous image, you have to have a good premise and then, as you showed me, um, the uh, one skill at guiding uh, the image generating AI um, was very important, like guiding it through iterations to get the best possible, you know, uh, version of the premise. Um, and that, you know, the, the human lacking uh, the artistic, yeah, the, the 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 artistic skill was not going to be able to generate that quickly. But the AI couldn't come up with a striking premise and go through iterations to find the best one without some human guidance. So it just made me, you know, because if, if if we're going to mention, how should we say, the apocalyptic scenarios, we should also mention the, you know, likely scenarios. Mm -hmm. Right. I was Which listening is... to a, a sixty Minutes interview last night about AI, and I it was a Google CEO, and I've apologize. I don't remember what his name was, but uh, he was basically saying, yes, a lot of jobs, you know, are going to be changed. Like they won't necessarily go away. We will still need humans, but the job descriptions are like, there's a lot of them that are going to be changing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. sorry. And one, one reason why I wanted to bring up Centaur and why that stuck with me um, is, you know, the first generation of uh, workplace Centaurs would likely be the Pluto and Sagittarius generation. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. And, and to your point, it's just like other technologies in the past, to the extent that humans can use it to enhance 
um, to enhance things that we're already doing or capabilities we have or to do things that we other to augment our abilities in a positive way so that we can do things that we couldn't do or do things faster. It'll be like other technologies and other technological shifts and paradigm shifts in the past, um, but hopefully we'll be able to navigate it um, over the next 20 years relatively well, but it'll be something to pay close attention to for, for sure. Well, if we look at how humans have navigated every other technological revolution, then um, <laughs> maybe yeah. 20 years to maybe get the hang of it, maybe not. A lot of times what? it takes 30 one part of it's also just like in the 1990s, like people had to use how to learn how to use like a personal computer, like a mouse and a keyboard, which is something that doesn't, it takes work to learn and doesn't come naturally. But once you do that, you could do a lot more than you can just do with like a pen and paper, or at least you can do it faster. Let's say you can send mm -hmm. out, you know, hundred emails in a day or 50 emails in a day versus just like writing five things. And I think there's something to your point in terms of the positive potential. And this is why so many companies are working towards it. That's just a basic example, but there's so many positive things um, that can come from it in the way that it can uh, speed up advancements in the good parts of humanity. I think that's why a lot of the companies are so focused on this as a potentially important um, you know, shift in technology that some of them are saying could be more important than like discovering fire or something like that, like, like huge paradigm shifts. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. It'll be an ongoing thing. Um, one thing interesting, Austin, you mentioned the um, triplicity shift and you and I had been talking about that and talking about Firmicus because I'd been researching some of what happened in the fourth century about how the Roman Empire had that pretty swift transformation to adopting Christianity in the Western Roman Empire, um, starting with the Emperor Constantine and then his sons, and that we had an astrologer like Firmicus Maternus, who was like right in the middle of that, in the middle of that century, first writing his astrology book in the early uh, 330s. And then about 10 or, or 15 years later, he had converted to Christianity and he wrote a a really strong, aggressive attack against the pagan uh, religions um, after becoming a Christian. And so you can see sometimes in a single lifetime, a person having a complete transformation. But you pointed out to me that there was a really major um, Jupiter-Saturn triplicity shift that was happening in that century. And I thought that was really interesting and really insightful because you know we're going through the same thing now. Um, in that century where it was shifting from conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn in Earth signs to air signs. And then recently we had that where in the 20th century it was all Earth signs and now it's shifted to air signs for like the next couple of centuries, right? Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things um, that's one of the things that if you do a little work on it, it makes Firmicus really relatable because he's living in um uh in an anxious phase of late empire where things have been not going so well for a while and big changes are sort of already happening but also um just over the horizon um you know he's right before so it's um uh, again he's like living through the christianization of rome but he's also um right around the period of time where the rest of the, the Western Roman Empire is going to fall very soon. And, you know, that that fall of the Western Empire and then that shift into what we call in retrospect, but they didn't call it at the time, the Byzantine phase. They were just like, it's Rome. We just moved the capital. Um, but that that shift into a very recognizable sort of second or third act for Rome is right around the corner. And when you you know, when you when you read his text, which is written to the like his, you know, uh, his local sort of the state governor or is loosely equivalent, Mavordius is loosely equivalent to like a state governor's, would you say, Chris, or would you sub in a different role? Yeah, something like it's his friend Mavordius who's like climbing the political ladder and eventually gets up to the highest, he the highest ladder at some point later which was um, consul, I think he eventually became. Oh, he he, he obtains consular power, mm -hmm. um, which 
Firmicus gives like 38 different combinations uh, for a nativity that will attain consular or so pro-consular power. But anyway, in that, yeah, you see the, um, you actually see, uh, I don't know, I, I find it very relatable living in a um, the late stages of a Western empire that has either just changed a lot or has big changes right over the horizon. Um, and there's a sense of anxiety. And you also read in Firmicus, there's, and, and if you read about that time period, um, there's a lot of like, oh, do we need to go back to the founding? Do we, you know, we, we've, we've fallen, we're, we're lazy and debauched. Do we need to reobtain those virtues? And you have, you know, uh, yeah, you, you have this, this concern about the, um, <laughs> about the debauchery of late empire, right? And do we do something else? Do we return? Um, and, you know, there's some very strong sort of make Rome great again energy mm -hmm. in Firmicus that it's like, oh, I, I like that makes sense. That's around um, that's around here at the, uh, the 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 we're just over the cusp right from a Saturn uh, from a uh, air, from an Earth period to an air period. But um, whereas ours is definite in the sense that we are now just doing air um, for almost 200 years. Um, Firmica, the, the fourth century in Rome, uh, has an unusual number of going back and forth between earth and air, right? Are we doing the old thing, like the more solid thing, the known thing, earth, or are we doing entering this more chaotic, who knows what's going to happen, period, air? And it's often that there'll be like one, there'll be like, uh, there'll be like one false positive where it looks like we're entering the new era, but actually it's going to be another 40 years. In Firmicus's case, it's literally, it's almost the whole century. It takes almost a whole century to decide on which era they're living in. That's really funny because there was later in the century, um, there was that one random emperor, Julian, who tried to like, after the empire had been like Christian for like a few decades, he tried to like reinstitute paganism um but then after his reign was over after a few years everything just went back to christianity and it stayed that way for the rest of for you know centuries right. so you know i just wanted to bring that up because it's such a major intellectual shift in terms of world history and in terms of like the western religious and philosophical and intellectual tradition that turning point from everything was like paganism and polytheism up to that point versus everything after that point for the most part at least the majority becomes monotheism and 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 you know christianity and this one religion sort of becoming the dominant religion in the empire for many 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 centuries so you know obviously we're not necessarily going through that kind of religious shift as far as we know but in terms of intellectual shifts right now i think paying attention to what are the emerging intellectual shifts and paradigms that might be shifting at this time that could have much more far reaching impact for for several centuries might be a good thing to do whether that's what we're seeing with technology and some of the implications of that or whether there's other intellectual trends that may shift in a way that's um dramatic and sort of like more more permanent or more lasting i think you know remains to be seen but it's something to pay attention to yeah, one well, I would say maybe not religious, but uh, I think it's pretty inarguable that Western culture has had a pretty significant value shift over the last, let's say, forty to sixty years, depending on how you want to measure it. Like since we could say since the sixties, um, and that you know that that can be actually that can be paralleled to the uh, to the sort of uh, the transition from um in a, an expansionist polytheism uh with rome to the um more how do we say uh uh the, yeah to the to the to the, the the orthodox christianity that followed it and then continued onward um if we're looking if we're examining in terms of like what are the beliefs and values of the state cult right which in rome looked like which which uh gods were endorsed and which weren't I, I do feel like there is if we're looking at you know western history we are sort of uh we we have lived through a, a shift in values and if we named them gods it would be easier uh to understand but like a, a shift in which you know which gods are venerated by the state cult and which are not yeah we're gonna have to change our minds about so much if this ai technology is part of all of this and the big shifts and 
you know, if, if we value certain ways of living or ways of being, or, you know, throw in the word meritocracy, all of that kind of gets thrown out the window with all of the changes in technology. So like, yeah, ideologically, what do we value and how does that change us or how do we change with that in a way that's skillful versus unskillful? Um, yeah, it'll probably take like hundreds of years. Yep. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. And I just want to quickly also shout out to going back, um, the Twitter user who I got the original prompt from for the cat AI that I sort of tweaked and changed, but their name is artichoke AI on Twitter. So if you do a search for them, you'll, you'll see their cool AI profile where they show lots of different prompts and different images they've generated. Um, yeah. So I think that's at that in terms of news stories, um, Trying to see if there's anything else I really wanted to mention. We, you know, of course we had eclipses. There was one little minor news story that I thought was interesting. It was just, uh, the, and Claire, you had mentioned this, that there was a solar eclipse mm -hmm. and it, it was like that day that rocket blew up that Elon Musk's company, SpaceX, was trying to launch. Um, it blew up shortly after launch. But then also around the same time, um, Elon made a major change of removing the blue check marks and the verification from Twitter profiles also over the past week, which I only think is interesting. I'm only mentioning because it was so notable. We all remember that he took over Twitter on that solar eclipse in Scorpio six months ago and at the end of October. So he's still, for some reason, like important stuff is still mm -hmm. happening with him on eclipse cycles, not just not just related to um you know, SpaceX, but also with Twitter. And mm -hmm. I think he also recently announced the launch, launch of a new AI company. So that could be important as well if he's trying to get in on that. Mm -hmm. um, anything yeah, else? One, yeah, one one quick note on the uh, on the recent solar eclipse. Um, so, you know, one thing that's interesting about the series, which that inaugurated, um, which will have half of its eclipses in, Le or excuse me, in Aries, um, so this first eclipse, sun in Aries, uh, was a hybrid eclipse. Um, we're dealing with the eclipse of the sun in the place that it's supposed to be exalted, right? Mm. Which is a, you know, uh, as we say, a, more of a shift, right? We're not shutting off a dim light. We're shutting off a bright light. Um, and insofar as the sun has to do with uh, a discrete identity, right? Like the sun is, how do, how do people know you? How do they see you? Oh, that's Claire. That's Chris, Right. <laughs> Um, the removal of the blue checks um, open uh, open the gate for lots of impersonations and um, identity theft or impersonation is something I've seen repeatedly with afflictions to the sun, especially mm -hmm. uh, nodal afflictions to the sun. Um, and I would also add that you know with uh, again with a with a solar eclipse in the first uh, of a, of a couple solar eclipses in the place where the sun is supposed to be exalted um we get sort of a reference to um some of the more archetypal like hierarchy sun monarch leader type stuff um and it was interesting to know to think that the the blue checks are literally a mark of hierarchy mm -hmm. um and that the you know we have the eclipsing of that so now there it removes that that visible different differentiator right because there was that there was only one differentiator of, of twitter accounts and that was it and it was a hierarchy right the um you had to earn a blue check mark blah 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 you couldn't just have one um and so the we have the yeah the eclipse of the sun there and the removal of that and that opening the way for a blurring or copying or impersonation of identity yeah mm -hmm. and it did create that hierarchy but that was like a side effect and an, almost an unintended side effect of the attempt to stop uh, identity impersonation which is the big threat of removing it and that's a really good point because that's additionally something we're going to be seeing a lot of in the future um myri Moscow in the ch live chat mentions deep fakes and that was a really notable thing we saw a month ago was the first big instance of some of this ai technology being used to create something that was fake politically, which was when there was that big thing about Trump announced that he was about to be arrested. And then the day came and by without anything happening, but somebody created a AI generated image of him being like tackled by some cops that went viral and got spread around. So I think that was the first big instance. I'll have to look up what the day was. It was about a month ago of AI being used to create something sort of 
politically, basically, in order to create a fake fake news story in a way. And with Saturn coming up on Neptune over the past three years and now co-present with it, I think that's going to be one of the biggest um, things that we're going to see as a recurring theme is the blurring of the difference between what is real and what is not real and the increasing challenge to tell the difference between the two as there's this dissolving of the boundaries between between them um because it's like that's happening there's also crazy advances in voice technology where now you can take a recording of somebody's voice and ai can pretty impressively and pretty convincingly just create brand new sentences that that person's never said before um just using ai and just a lot of things heading in that direction we're heading and, and this is somehow just the beginning of saturn that saturn neptune transit which is just kind of wild to think about yeah well the um you know the phrase fake news um was popularized during the 2016 presidential race which was saturn square neptune right, right. so now we're at the the next angular configuration of saturn and neptune um and you know like the yeah we're, we're back there right we're back there but um it's the conjunction this time or the co-presence rather than just a square so mm -hmm. it, it's um at maximum volume and increasing for the next couple of years yeah and i think that square story that you just mentioned speaks to like have we adjusted have we done the necessary adjustments no <laughs> we haven't but yeah the square speaking to adjustment feels right as well yeah and it's going to be a long period for all of us to adjust to uh, but it'll be interesting to see where we're at at the end of that and what we've learned at the end of that process. Um, first, in basically in three years, once Saturn finishes up in Pisces, but then not fully finished until three years after that, when Saturn departs from Aries, since Saturn and, and Neptune will move into Aries around the same time, about three years from now. So I think I'm just going to focus my Saturn-Neptune energy on continuing to create cat pictures uh that blur the line between reality and not reality and and we'll see how the rest of the world world does all right so i think that's good for the news segment shall we shall we um do a, a mid-show sort of transition at this point yes sure. okay cool so um one of the things is i did want to give a shout out to our sponsors for this episode the first one is the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is actually happening this month in May from the 25th through the 29th, 2023, uh, just outside of Seattle, Washington. And this conference is a first for them because they're actually doing a hybrid conference where you can either attend in person or you can attend simultaneously online to a live version that they're going to be streaming at the same time. So I believe there's 27 speakers that are each going to be giving a bunch of different lectures as well as uh, pre and post conference workshops. Um, I believe Austin, you are you are one of those uh, lecturers, right? Yeah, I'm a. I have two lectures, and then I have the pre conference workshop. So I will be kicking off the whole thing, and that's um, that is a discussion of all 35 combinations of three planets all interacting with each other mm -hmm. and so we'll be going through all 35 as well as establishing oh some some rules and ways to make that thinkable so it's not all just like a blur um but i'm really excited i've been working on that um you know it'll be like a lot of my work uh, as much historical material and research as possible as a trampoline um to get into interesting places so i'm I'm really and it's sort of an you know unofficial sequel to what i did last year um with the pre-conference workshop which was uh dealing with all of the pairs of planets so i'm very excited i think it's i i don't believe it's sold out yet the uh it's sold out last year so if you want to sign up uh, please do now so that they don't have to turn you away because I would feel bad. Yeah, I think there was a announcement not too long ago that they are filling up and it probably will sell out just like it did last year here pretty soon. So get your tickets if you want to attend in person. But even if you can't or you don't, you can sign up to attend live um, through their website or afterwards one of the things that's great about Norwalk is they always re record all of the lectures and workshops and then you can buy those or, or purchase those after the conference is over through their website 
Um, so you can find out more information about that at norwac.net. And I'll put a link to it in the description below this video or on the podcast website for this for this episode. Quick question, Chris. Yeah. Is Norwac the only Norwac is the only major astrological conference this year, correct? Yeah, correct? it's only the only major conference because there's no other big organizations right now that are hosting one. Like the NCGR isn't, nor is ESAR, nor are they pooling their resources for a mega conference for a UAC. So I think Norwac is kind of it this year for big conferences. All right. Yeah. So if you want to meet some astrologers, <laughs> that's uh, yeah. literally your best opportunity. For sure. And I think Demetra is doing workshop there and lots of other astrologers that have been on the podcast in the past. So check it out at norwac.net. Um, other than that, we also have another sponsor this year of a, a product I'm actually pretty stoked about, which is this new um, Oracle fixed star card set and guide um, called the Bethenian Fixed Star Oracle and Guide Set, which was created by um, astrologer and past guest on the podcast in the past, Ryan Butler, as well as artist and astrologer Terry Johnston, who put together 15 illustrated cards that illustrate each of the, the 15 most important fixed stars that were used um, in, the, in traditional astrology and in different branches of it. So the uh, cards and the booklet gives a brief history of the Bohemian fixed stars and their planetary correspondences and their use in magical practice. Um, in addition, each card can be drawn as an oracle to aid a person in the deliberation of a question. Um, I know that's something you're you're a fan of, Austin, in terms of like using the tarot for for deliberations and things like that. And you gave me some advice recently on that that I, I thought was helpful. Yeah, yeah, no, um, cardomancy is really is great. And it's, um, there's a lot of there, uh, there's very, there's much less competition between astrology. And I, you know, I use the Rider Waite Tarot, but just various cardomantic uh, methods like this. I, I often, uh, I often use cards where the astrology ends, right? Like I, I can see up to this point, but I still need guidance or information. Um, and then that's where the cards start and then, and vice versa. Sometimes I'll start with reading cards and then need to get, you know, more of a, a, a Google maps, uh, Google earth view from, uh, from astrology. Yeah. Um, so let's see. So the book, um, and the cards provides a three-tiered approach to incorporating them into a personal practice, study, contemplation, and divination. The booklet gives the history, like I said, and explores the symbols, myths, and meanings and correspondences of these fixed stars, um, but it can also be used as a tool for con contemplation, where each card features original interpretations of images passed down through the tradition and includes constellations and glyphs of the stars that invites us to have a deeper understanding of the star's lore and significance. Um, so each deck contains 15 illustrated cards and a 68 page study guide. And the illustrations are just incredibly beautiful for those not watching the video version. Uh, Terry just did an amazing job illustrating these cards. And I was actually really impressed just by how, how pretty they are. In addition to the information that Ryan packed into the book. So you can find out more information about this, or you can order your deck. Uh, by heading over to medievalastrologyguide.com slash star cards. So medievalastrologyguide.com slash star cards. And I'll put a link to that uh, in the uh, on the description page for this episode. So the cards are just $38 for a pack. And they literally just um, got these together and just shipped out the first set of them recently. So it's pretty exciting seeing somebody and seeing a up and coming astro not up and coming but somebody who was an up and coming astrologer Ryan Butler who was on very early episodes of the podcast and was one of the like younger astrologers back when me and Austin were coming up and now we're all kind of like old people at this point doing you know these amazing projects with different books or these cards or other things and it's really heartening to see yeah 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 it's funny Take my money. like oh I remember, yeah, it's funny to think of someone as like up and coming. It's like, oh yeah, in 2012, uh, it's only yeah, a few years right. in, <laughs> right? right? Like almost, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, but I would just add one more thing about cards. Cards are an ideal way to just learn things, 
-hmm. you know, with, and when you're, if you're divining with them or contemplating um, with cards, you're also reinforcing the meaning set and the associations. And so I would say they're, they're also uh, educational. So I know everybody loves educational things. <laughs> Yeah, it's that. And also um, glyphs are really important. That's one of the things that came up in the Egyptian astrology episode that I hope people check out is one of the things we talked about is we um, recent research has shown even more than past research had in the earlier part of the 20th century, how some of the glyphs or the symbols that astrologers use for the signs of the zodiac were actually derived in some pretty clear cases from um, Egyptian hieroglyphs, or in some instances, the symbols that were used in Demotic Egyptian. So some of our actual tradition of using just a single pictorial symbol to represent um, astrological placements like planets and signs of the zodiac actually derives from that older tradition going back to Egypt of using specific like um, little pictures or hieroglyphs in order to represent words and phrases and things like that. I think that was really interesting. And also, of course, ties into what you're working on, Austin, where the Deccans were originally illustrated with these figures, um, these like exotic figures that would represent each of the 36 Deccans, and that those illustrations were meant to convey visually something deep about the symbolic interpretation of that Deccan. Yeah. And um, I mean, the they weren't just originally um, uh, illustrated or imagined visually. Um, you have that that um, conspicuously visual quality of the Deccans um, goes for measurably thousands of years, and the the styles change, the conventions change. Um, but you know, sh um, you can look at um, ancient Egyptian uh, versions of that, where gods or certain um, uh, the gods in a certain circumstance are associated with a given Deccan. Um, but then, you know, you can go 15th, 16th century, you know, 2000 plus late years later, and you've still got figures involved in a situation with, you know, particular implements, um, often sort of blurring the line between, oh, this is an image of a person in a situation versus is that a god that somebody like scratched the name off of? Like, why are they holding a lamp, uh, you know, a lamp and a, and a huge axe and why are their eyes on fire? Um, <laughs> but yeah, 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 for sure. Um, well, and then there's just something about image, what an image can convey that sometimes is deeper and more nuanced and wider than words. Like you can, you can try to convey something in words, but you can actually pack like a lot into an image. That's kind of surprising how much meaning and subtlety you can actually get into something. And I think that's what things like like tarot or oracle cards or even glyphs or things like Deccans really get to it's the heart of something that um yeah I hadn't thought about it in that way in a while until I was doing that that Egyptian astrology episode mm. oh that, yeah that's um I I it's almost as if um how should we say yeah communicate when when we're when we have completely abstracted language where the letters don't resemble or evoke anything. It's almost like we've severed, like the original communication is both an image and a sound, right? You know, a sort of primordial communication is going to be both. Um, and, you know, you can say left and right side of the brain, we're just hitting different centers simultaneously. And, you know, uh, as um, esoteric as that is and sounds, that's also why memes work. Right. That's mm -hmm. why people are right. like, oh, that's perfect. I have to spread yeah. that everywhere because it's hitting both sides. Language right. is limiting. It's limited. Yeah. Um, and here's actually the table that we talked about in the Egyptian astrology episode. This is by an article by um, an Egyptologist named Andreas Winkler, but he showed how um, some of the demotic, the symbols used in demotic Egyptian to represent the signs of the zodiac. Um, are pretty well tied in with our current glyphs, like for example, Taurus and the bull, and the horns of the bull. Um, but specifically, Libra was the symbol for like the the setting sun or the horizon. Or Sagittarius is like an arrow that's pointed sort of like up into the right. Or Aquarius is the um, mm. it's like three wavy lines in Demotic Egyptian. Apparently, you know, we've simplified it to two wavy lines. But it's still sort of the same thing. So you can see those clear parallels and how 
it's just really crazy because it means some of our our basic symbols go back, you know, to these Egyptian um, priest astrologers that were using this in the temples. Yeah, so that's, neat. and so with Capricorn, so that's an onk, and then it's a little little head, like a like a head or goat head. But yeah, the problem is like Capricorn is always weird because it's like the goat horned one is what it says in Greek. Um, or in the Babylonian tradition, it's like the goat fish. So it's like people always right. kind of struggle to render that. So they're like, uh, this is the best I can come up with. In uh, in Vedic astrology, it's um, the, the, the word translates kind of to sea monster um, but or water monster, which often kind of gets turned interpreted as like crocodile or alligator, right? Which is a very, you know, which is sort of, you know, aquatic, but not um and monstrous but you know etc cetera, etc cetera. i'd be down right. with that i'd love to be a sea monster that's sweet right right yeah <laughs> yeah i like that saturn is in sea monster right now uh, I'd like, that'd be good on the forecast yeah it certainly was yeah yeah well, and was. you know and crocodiles crocodiles work for saturn in a lot of ways for a saturnian sign especially mm -hmm. like the earth sign because crocodiles just sit there for 99 percent of their lives when they don't explode into death um like they're very they're very low energy um <laughs> like the, the they intervene with situations only as needed i like that analogy because crocodiles tough skin very soft interior very, mm -hmm. and yeah. like aquatic kind of right but not like a graceful dolphin or agile fish right they just kind of hang out right um and so it's an earth sign and you know it's mud but water but you know yeah, I like I like Capricorn as, uh, for or I like a uh, um uh alligator or crocodile. Actually when Kate did the um uh, the Saturn in Cap series for um Sphere and Sundry, um there were there were there was a sub variant of uh alligator series where actual alligator bone and in some cases swamp mud um mm -hmm. that alligators have been in was integrated into the material. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's perfect. Last note on that. Like I was just seeing a meme and it was about how, like when a crocodile is on the water, you can just see its little eyes and its face. And it looks very scary, very competent and intimidating, like a Capricorn, but then you look under the water and they just look kind of silly and they're just kind of, <laughs> it's like, it's perfect. If when you see them at night, um, their eyes are hyper reflective. Mm -hmm. And so if you have any light source at all, the eyes appear to glow red orange. Nice. I got yeah, to cool. see that in person many years ago. A friend of mine worked at a like a nature conservancy swamp in Florida and was like, hey, come visit me. And then literally we went spearfishing in alligator infested waters. Um, and he I don't he, he has like an adrenal problem where he doesn't feel fear. And so he led us into um, extremely physically dangerous situations that made a good story in retrospect. Nice. Five planets in Scorpio. It's <laughs> good. Not feeling fear. Um, I like also alligators like are kind of like you said, sedentary, but like they can move quick when they want to. Mm -hmm. Like they can do that explosion of energy, which is like that cardinal sign, which is really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that expl initial explosion of like of getting out fast, but just not having a lot of long-term staying power. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, alligator cardio is not uh, is not top is not top notch. Yeah, it's those tiny, tiny legs. All right. So I think that's pretty good. Shall we transition into talking about the astrology of May? Yeah, let's do it. Do it. All right. So I'm going to put the graphic up one more time just to show people where we're starting here at the top of the month, where right at the top of the month, we have Pluto stationing retrograde in Aquarius, making its very first stationary, the very first station of the next 20 years. And it's going to make many, 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 many more stations over the next 20 years. This is the first one. So this is notable and one to pay attention to. Um, and it's interesting that it falls like right in the middle of that Mercury retrograde cycle where Mercury is going to conjoin the sun on the same day. Because usually what I've noticed, especially over the past 10 years of doing these forecasts, is it's really sometimes there's an issue that's set up um, when Mercury goes retrograde, when stations retrograde at the beginning of the retrograde phase, but by the time you get to the conjunction, like there starts to be some turn or some shift towards a revolu uh, resolution of whatever the retrograde issues were, um, and it's really interesting that that's falling, sort of coinciding at that point. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and one way that that um, that change in the quality of the retrograde is addressed in Dorotheus in on ele in terms of elections um, is that if you do something Mercury um, before it's had the conjunction to the sun, then it's got that ahead of it. Right. Then like, you know, you have this really dramatic uh, as combustion and aspect that's going that's in the future. Whereas even if it's still retrograde, once you've had the conjunction to the sun, Mercury's not coming back to the sun at that point. Right. That you don't you don't have that in the future. The future looks like it rising again rather than returning to the sun and being invisible. Hmm. Right. Like if Mercury retrograde is a story arc and that Kazemi is the middle point, then of course, yeah, the last half, then of course, half of it's over. And if we know that things should be wrapping up in the next few weeks, then yeah, it's probably going to be a better, better outcome or circumstance well, than if you go before. It, right. Right. And an outcome that's more in accord with what you intend. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, or if the Mercury retrograde is an underworld journey, um, the conjunction with the sun is the bottom. And even though you're still beneath the surface, um, the path is leading up and back to the world rather than like, you know, whatever you're into the interview with Hades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And usually also, cause one of the things Mercury retrogrades can coincide with is like doing something once at the beginning of the retrograde and having it fail or having things go awry and needing to do it over again. And usually by the time of the conjunction, whatever that second or third attempt is, things start to work out. And, and usually on the second or third attempt, you do a better job of it because you've had the experience of like the first two attempts and you've sort of learned from those. Um, so even though it can be annoying or frustrating or sometimes kind of painful, um, sometimes it can also be constructive. So that Mercury retrograde, as we talked about in last month's forecast, began on the 21st of April. So people can pay attention to if there are some major things that started coming up for them around that time in terms of Mercury retrograde issues, starting to see a resolution of that by the first and then perhaps things not being fully resolved until later in the month when Mercury actually stations direct on the on the 14th. Yeah, and it's worth noting that um, the, as we say, Mercury's reemergence into the world, the going direct, being visible again, um, is relatively dramatic because it'll put Mercury right next to right next to a newly ingressed Jupiter, which has also recently become visible again. Um, like the 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 you know the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow of this retrograde is pretty nice. Um, it's like a well-stocked Easter basket. Um, I, I'm very I've tried to stay focused on how much I like where this Mercury retrograde gets us to rather than mm. the process. The process is not so good, um, but like the where where we end up on the other side of it is pretty cool. Yeah, because you got to get through uh, eclipse season. Basically, everybody's got to make it through this Mercury retrograde and through eclipse season and the intensification of the Pluto transit with Pluto stationing in Aquarius. So it's like the first you know, week or so of the month is still kind of tumultuous. And there's a lot of things that are still up in the air and not resolved, or even new things that are kind of being thrown up in the air. Um, but then later in the month, you're right, once Mercury stations direct, and then we get our second lunation of the month, which is that Taurus new moon on the, the 19th, we get our first like non-eclipse lunation, and hopefully things start to start to settle down by then. Yeah, mm -hmm. things look pretty good by then which mm -hmm. is two thirds the way through the month. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, dust settles by the end of the month, but this like, that's the end of the month. So yeah, first half versus second half, I think is pretty, pretty stark this month. Like mm -hmm. I like the second half way more. The first half is, you know, uh, so um, Chris, as you mentioned, uh, we basically entered eclipse season and also began a Mercury retrograde within one day of each other. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that both of those have in common um, is that they both have a a lack of vision, not not in some sort of spiritual or ambitious sense, but um, like it's hard to see where you're going. You know, that's that's what eclipses are, is where there's supposed to be light that that you can navigate by, like during the day sun um, or during the night of the full moon, the brightest night of the month lunar eclipse right there's a like a removal of light that's supposed to be there which allows you to navigate and then a, a big part of a mercury retrograde is that it also becomes invisible you can no longer see mercury during the morning nor in the evening 
And so not being able to see where things are going um, is its own kind of malefic quality, right? I was trying, I was giving an example the other day when I was teaching about how obscurity is malefic, but not like Mars and not like Saturn. Um, in that when I, when I come to my bedroom, um, when I come, when I stumble into bed, um, you know, a minute before dawn and it's dark, um, like I can hurt myself by, as, and I have several times by racking my shin on the bed frame, the bed frame is not a weapon. It is not poisoned. It is not bladed, right? It's not like actively malefic, but it becomes, uh, it bec it acts as if it were malefic as if it could do harm simply because I can't see where the fuck I'm going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then your honest being co-present just adds another layer of, whoa of racking your shin in the dark yeah, yeah. <laughs> surprise yeah um that's a really good point so because it's like the sun is the source of light in our solar system and light becomes associated with seeing like that which is illuminated um is that which we can see when it's light out versus when it becomes completely pitch dark you can't see and i like those notions of obscurity because one of the things that's important that happens with eclipses is, is sometimes really monumental events happen in our life where you start doing something or there's a shift towards something. But under eclipses, you don't always realize how monumental it is until until a much time, a time later in retrospect, basically. So I, I like what you're saying with that, Austin, because eclipses can sometimes be really important turning points where something starts to shift and there's a major beginning or ending in a person's life. Um, but it's not always like readily apparent. And sometimes it's only when you look back on it, you realize, oh, like I met that person or, oh, I started working on this at that time or what have you. And then you realize the full significance of it, but there's something almost inherently obscured or, or hidden about eclipses. Yeah. I, um, one way I, I think about and work with eclipses is that, you know, the nodes are transiting signs all the time and but in that their their work is inherently obscure right like they're like underground rivers they're flowing but you can't see what they're doing and then eclipses bring that uh bring that energy very like for just an hour or two right um four times a year into intersection with the you know the visible world and the, they're almost like it's almost like um uh it, it's like um how when a planet stations it um, it's been working on stuff for a while, but there's a, a bit of a, a pivotal point or an exclamation mark. Um, and that eclipses sort of, um, you know, they 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 let what has been collecting and latent make a make a very temporary um dent. They turn that potential energy into kinetic for just a second, which may change the direction of things. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're talking about all of this because, um, you know, we've already had one eclipse as we head into the month, which is that one in in April, and now we're coming up on the second one right in the first week of the month. So as soon as that first eclipse has happened, it's like the the door to eclipse season is opened, and we're about to go through the next door here. Um, when the moon hits 15 degrees of Scorpio on May 5th, it looks like. So that is our next um, lunar eclipse in Scorpio. And this one's important because it's a continuation of the eclipse series that's been taking place, bouncing back and forth between Taurus and Scorpio over the course of the past year or so. Um, and we've seen a lot of uh, things thrown up in, in people's lives, especially with fixed sign placements during that time. And this is the very last eclipse in Scorpio. There's one more in Taurus, so on the axis, but this will be for those who, you know, who dwell in Scorpio <laughs> or have important investments in Scorpio. Um, this is the last one in Scorpio. Okay, I like that. Um, yeah, so we'll see the closing down of the major um, shifts and the major uh, tendency towards there being new beginnings and new endings. Um, with this eclipse, and then it's finally fully brought to completion six months later when we have that final one in Taurus in, what is it, October, I believe, at the very end of October, on October 28th. Yeah, yeah and that'll be the, the, the lunar in Taurus. Yeah, so this one I see um, 
it, it goes exact at 15 degrees of Scorpio. And then the very next aspect it makes is that opposition to Uranus, which is at 18 degrees of Taurus. So there's still a major uh, sort of unexpected or disruptive Uranian element to this eclipse, which I think is made as we've talked about before, like a little bit more disruptive because it's happening in that fix, those fixed signs of Taurus and Scorpio, which as fixed signs already don't do the best with changes, especially sudden or unexpected ones. Um, and I've seen a lot of that, you know, happening in different people's personal lives in terms of it um, just destabilizing certain things in order to make room for other things. Yeah. And I was noticing too, because I always like to look at where the moon's headed after a thing that it does. So it hits Uranus and then it's also going to run into Mars and then Pluto and then Saturn. So it just feels like a bumpy, like even after the eclipse the next day too, just feels bumpy. Yeah. One, one of the things that struck me when I looked at it was the um, how much is going on in water signs and how not great it is. Right, so we have the a partial eclipse of the moon in its fall in Scorpio, um, it, it configured to and in a mutually received relationship with fallen Mars in Cancer, and then we have we also have a malefic in Pisces, and then the Neptune in Pisces, and so what ran through my mind was all sorts of um, sort of toxic. Um, <laughs> uh toxic or uh, yeah toxic water um there's a song i was listening to the other day where one of the one of the lines references a raging uh, a, a raging river of manure at my front door and so i thought about that i also thought about like you know a toxic grail um a toilet desperately in need of flushing right with the south node you know it's the dragon's tail and if the dragon's mouth eats the dragon's tail poops um, and there's this purgative quality uh, to purgative, yeah, a purgative quality to the south node. And so this just looked like ucky water that needed to be flushed, be purged, you know, um, be sent to the waste treatment facility, um, you know, whatever. Um, so, and, and I yeah. say in all good friendliness while good intention but right now I, I regret showing you how to use an image generator yesterday <laughs> <laughs> uh being reminded of some of your evocative metaphors over the years right I, so uh, uh, uh mid journey I, imagine poop dragon gentleman style gentleman, yeah <laughs> with yeah. different hats <laughs> right with a top hat all right, now I understand what the AI people are feeling like and what Oppenheimer felt like in terms of developing the atomic bomb and just thinking like, what have I, what have I done? Yeah, I've well become the god of death. Um, of tools. But so um, I would be surprised if there weren't some um, like literal physical things involving um, toxic water or sewage, but on a you know, on a psychological psychic level, like this is, I think this one's going to bring up a lot of feelings, um, which, you know, um, it would be good to barf out or to, you know, to purge to like cathart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was something you mentioned earlier, Claire, in terms of just like water pollution issues with Saturn and Pisces seem like they're coming up a lot recently. Yeah. And just like water erosion, displaced communities from all the water. So yeah, all kinds of stuff. Were you going um, what to say I was something thinking, before that? Me? Um, I, I mean, I was just thinking too, like, and that more like psychological armchair psychologist kind of uh, thing with the water and all of the feelings that could possibly be coming up. And then on the other side of the moon over in Taurus, we've got Mercury, who's supposed to be kind of the rational person in the group um, amongst others. But, and then in Taurus, which is a sign where it's earth, it's material. It's kind of like, we see what is really in front of us. What am I tasting, smelling, seeing? Um, and that faculty is compromised because Mercury is retrograde with the node, you know, with Uranus. So it's like, we've got all these feelings happening and perceptions, but what are we perceiving? And is that actually accurate? Feelings are real. They're not always accurate. So you know, when it comes to like practical advice, what do you do during this configuration? I mean, my personal thing is like nothing. You don't do anything. Don't do anything. <laughs> Unless of course it's like taking care of your, your plumbing, <laughs> like take care of that. But yeah, you might want to like pump the brakes with the feelings, you know? Yeah. Drink lots of distilled yeah. water or the emotional equivalent of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, heightened emotions for sure. I mean, I'm thinking back to the eclipses in October and just the intensity of some of that towards the end of October when we had our last Scorpio eclipse. And I think we can expect uh, some of that happening here. Um, in addition to that, just going back, having that first Pluto station in, in Aquarius, for people that have planets in early fixed signs, Although some people may have felt that if you then have a planet that's getting aspected by Pluto as soon as Pluto ingressed into Aquarius, it's really those first stations, I think, oftentimes that will activate that aspect and make it much more clear what that's going to be about, um, both internally as well as in terms of like external events in a person's life. So I think that's a really important thing underlying this eclipse here in that fixed sign of Scorpio as well is having Pluto activated in Aquarius for the first time also sort of at the same time. Yep. Have the two of you been seeing anything coming up with Pluto and Aquarius so far with in terms of like those like natal things with clients or with other observations? I've uh I was talking to one of my students the other day who had a who has a zero sun in Aquarius and they were feeling it and it was very like classical Pluto stuff. Um, but, um, other than that, I haven't, it's been so clear on the collective, but I haven't really like, um, I don't know, you know, I, I have lots of things in water signs. I usually feel the transits very deeply, but I haven't really felt it on a personal level or like seen it up close. Hmm. I've been noticing like some of my, it's the clients with stuff in very early, like degrees, zero, one degrees that are aspecting that. And they're just going through like big transitions that were already kind of in the works as Pluto approached that by degree from Capricorn, like, you know, kids moving out to college for the first time and, you know, having that big transition with Pluto in the fifth or something. So nothing like bad, just very normal, big transitions in that area of their life. But yeah, very early degree connections are necessary. I've been seeing, um, I have some, well, my ascendant is at, or no, my Venus is at five degrees of Aquarius. So, mm. eh, I mean, I plead the fifth on exactly what it is, but like, I feel like I've been noticing, but I'm not, you know, yeah, I, 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 have I need Venus time. At, I have Venus at two Aquarius and okay. I was expecting, I was expecting a little bit more, I don't know, a little bit more from the inside. Mm. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But not, not so far, but you know, Pluto, when, an, you know, when a normal, when any other planet is two degrees away um from uh you know one of your natal planets that means it's about to hit it when pluto is two degrees away it could be two years away from actually conjoining it right and so the right. the translation from like the the distance in space on a chart into distance in time from how long how far from now is that is so different with pluto Mm -hmm. I've actually, it's just quick side note. I've been noticing that with Neptune on my moon, like even just a degree away has been a big difference. So yeah, versus being right on top of it because it is so slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's check in with all the Aquarius placement people and other fixed sign people after that station and after that second eclipse in Scorpio and see how things are going. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, there's one other thing also that happened that Claire, you mentioned, which is Jupiter is going to make a helical rising and appear early in the month out from under the beams of the sun as a morning star um, early in the mornings when just before sunrise, you'll see Jupiter rise up over the eastern horizon and it's now it's within that 15 degree range of the sun so that it's finally going to be far enough from the sun that you'll see it briefly in the sort of hour or so before sunrise as a, a star over on the eastern horizon. So Jupiter's completed its passage through and it's um sort of you know sp you know speaking of the you know going into the sort of eye of Sauron and into Morador, it's completed its sort of like underground journey through the beams of the sun and now it sort of emerges in the morning uh a, a, a new sort of revived at this point. Yeah, uh, I always like to watch what happens when planets come out from under the beams, uh, because uh, I mean, in the case of Jupiter, maybe, you know, be in the spirit of the law, court rulings, opportunities, truths, understandings, maybe those might be easier to find, more probable to find with Jupiter visible versus that planet's significations being hidden and not visible. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if some of those things come up in the next month. 
Yeah, I'm. That's uh, that's uh, as we say. Part of what I'm really excited about this month is Jupiter reemerging and then going into Taurus, and uh, Mercury also coming back to that first decan of Taurus to station direct. And so we have this really fresh Jupiter, right? Like just did the, um, you know, like the full, um, like uh, a purification by fire, combustion, sweat lodge, like ready to start a new thing. And then also moving into a new sign to start new work. Um, and then having a, a, a what will also be a, a freshly arisen morning Mercury um, right there with it in the same decan. Um, so... Um, I'm thinking of uh, Jupiter. It just occurred to me, um, Claire, that uh, that Jupiter in Aries, that in those last few degrees, but Jupiter freshly arising in uh, in Aries is so the Macho Man. <laughs> like that's very much in like an oh yeah right like sort of moment. <laughs> it truly is, yeah, yeah. And like that deck into like being ruled by what is like Venus and Jupiter, and just like flamboyantly so, okay. like just. <laughs> And the transition into Taurus is, oh yeah, snap into a Slim Jim, like literally selling nice. these products. Exactly what I was thinking when I was making this prompt. I was okay, like, okay. and I was telling Chris before the show too, like when I was looking and we'll talk about it in a minute, but that T-square between Pluto, Jupiter and Mars, once Mars gets into Leo, this is where Randy Savage came from. I was intuiting, oh. like, what could that be like? And I was like, Randy okay. Savage, like could mm. be one of those things, but in like a spirit sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, that works. The, the, the Mars and Leo. So powerful. <laughs> and just, yeah, Mars, Jupiter is, I mean, you know, he's, um, we remember, <laughs> we remember more for his enthusiasm, um, you know, and big presence than his actual combative e efficacy, right? Totally. I like that. All right. So that's our, our image for this, especially with Jupiter. <laughs> Um, in the tail end of Aries and whatever the good things, the positive things or the period of growth and expansion that we were getting from, that some people were getting from that transit of Jupiter and Aries, this is the very tail end of it where some of those lessons are sort of finalized and um, yeah, brought full circle before Jupiter uh, departs and moves into Taurus mid-month. Mm -hmm. Worth noting also that uh, Jupiter in one system is the ruler of the third decan of Aries. In the other, it's mm -hmm. Venus, but the third decan of Aries, um, you know, ruled in ruled uh, in two systems in both cases by a benefic, has much more to do with like the outputting, uh, like the flamethrower of charisma rather than an actual flamethrower, which you might see in the mm -hmm. first decan of Aries. It's very performative. Um, you can think of like Jupiter in the third decan of Aries, like um, uh, like a preacher at a revival, like a stand-up comedian, like a like a like a one uh, like a one person show. It's it's that kind of Aries energy, um, mm -hmm. rather than the like uh, you know the sort of more literal martial standard type. Totally. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, all right, so other things that we need to mention about that first week of the month. I think this is looking pretty, pretty good so far. Yeah. The other thing I was kind of wondering about in this first week as it leads us into the eclipse is there's going to be a square between Venus and Neptune, which the last time we had one of those was early December when all of that Lenza app stuff was going on and we had all this oh, like yeah. illusory beauty and romanticized versions of, of beauty and all these things. So I, I don't know, you know, and relationally speaking, of course, a hard aspect with Neptune does not confer for us to, to have a good understanding necessarily of what our relationships are doing um, and having that leading us into the eclipse. Eh, I don't love it, but yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. That's a great point because that's really it. That that aspect of Venus Neptune goes exact the day before the eclipse on May fourth, while the Moon is already in Scorpio. So it's like the intensity, the sort of emotional intensity of that eclipse um, is softened, or at least we have this other element that's being thrown into the picture of this Venus that's like super idealizing things and is super doing the Venus Neptune thing which is like the the idea of being in love with the idea of being in love in some ways mm -hmm. yeah or just checking out and doing something pleasurable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah they um I don't know yeah so the first week is like you know it's sewery we're like Mercury's still super retrograde we're moving into this eclipse there's you know and that like whatever that whatever foul waters are due to erupt like you know we'll probably be 
feeling that for several days leading up to it. Um, but like, you know, like a good puke, you feel so much better afterwards. I think the positive way to regard that, uh, uh, the, that, that upcoming eclipse is like, yeah, it's, it's a good, you know, it's a good shit. Um, purgative, purgative <laughs> right. is like the triple word score word. Love it for that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, but like, well, that's another, <laughs> then we're, we're on to new things after yeah. that. So because just really quickly, because that's one of our signatures then of closest aspects with the um, eclipse, um, could we just give a couple more keywords of like Venus square Neptune? So before that was a really good in instance, Claire, from last year of like when the Lenza app happened and everybody was making these super idealized and, and oftentimes like much more visually engaging or like beautiful images of themselves and there was something that was both uh, interesting and beautiful about that as well as deceptive at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's the issue. Sometimes with Avena, it can be very positive because there can be something very um, romantic and engaging about Venus, Neptune, uh, hard aspects, but also something potentially deceptive so that maybe part of the advice is to um, enjoy it and enjoy sometimes the ability to get lost in that as something that's enjoyable, but also to be careful because you have to realize that your um, expectations or that your picture of reality might not be the clearest right now. And you might not be seeing things or seeing people for, for who they are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And Venus in an air sign too would like to, you know, be a little bit more intellectual and like fact-based, but that aspect from Neptune is not really supporting that. Um, yeah. And yeah, one of the things that's I would, been, I, I would just say that it's like watching a television show. It's like entertaining and hopefully a good TV show is going to be pretty to watch and entertaining, engaging. Um, but like, don't mistake it for what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's a like loosely based on a true story. Um, but it's that, you know, uh, uh, like you don't make judgments. Um, you don't make important judgments or decisions about relationships based on what you're getting during a Venus Neptune square. Bingo. It's I mean, it's only I, loosely based on a true story, yes. though it may be entertaining. Ideally, yes. although when when you're in the middle of that, that advice always falls on flat. It you doesn't know, always. Death. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> it's I mean, the rest of the sky but, like, is pretty watery. To, yeah, it's easy to recognize you. You're like something's like, oh, this is great. We'll see how long this lasts. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. If um, our, I mean, if if Mercury's retrograde and the intense stuff with the eclipse, like it's just not a time for, like in my mind, this is not a time to be making sweeping decisions like about anything. Yeah. If you can avoid it. Yeah. One of the things that's been nice since that also marks, since by then Venus is getting towards the end of Gemini. Um, is that's really come in and act as like a soothing effect or putting some ointment over the past several weeks on that area that just had sort of like burns for months of Mars going mm. retrograde there in Gemini. And I feel like uh, for a number of people, um, we've seen Venus come in and sort of smooth over the rough edges or sort of like put some aloe vera or something on the areas of irritation um, in that parts of their charts over the past several months. Yeah. Agreed. Speaking as someone whose Mar uh, who's moon got Mars for eight months, um, Venus in Venus's time in Gemini has proved a, an indispensable part of the make Gemini fun again campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm kind of hoping to like Venus going into cancer to the same point, Venus going into cancer after the eclipse on the seventh is going to be kind of a balm for whatever cancer has been going through with Mars in there. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. That's one of the, that's one of the things I'm also really looking forward to later mm -hmm. in the month. Yeah. Good point. So Venus into Gemini started April 11th and then it ends on the 9th of May. And then we get Venus and cancer from the 9th of May forward all the way into early June. All right, so that's good for the first week. That really brings us into transits for the second week where we're talking at this point about Venus going into Cancer on the 7th. Um, and it's already, you know, Mars hasn't departed yet. Mars is still in Cancer. So there's still some, some tension. There's still the potential for some irritation or some fighting or some discord that's been going on in that sector of our charts um, ever since Mars went into Cancer here, what was it, a month or two ago now? 
Um, but now Venus is coming in in order to help balance things out a little bit more and help to offset the extremeness of the the fieriness of Mars. Yeah, and, and Venus, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, she's getting a nice uh, trine from Saturn too, once she gets in there. That's nice. Yeah, so as soon as Venus hits, goes into Cancer, it starts applying to a trine with Saturn, and Venus will complete that trine around May 12th and May 13th. And mm -hmm. it looks like around the same time, the moon moves into Pisces and conjoins Saturn at the same time. So that time frame of around, especially May 13th, um, yeah, May, May 12th, May 13th has a little bit of a sobering uh, quality with Saturn there, but hopefully it's like a good type of so sobering quality with mm -hmm. Venus trining Saturn at the same time. And there's like, a real uh, coming down to reality and a realistic assessment of things, especially uh, relational things mm -hmm. after the square between Venus and Neptune that we encountered at the end of Venus and Gemini. My thoughts exactly. I was thinking it was going to be, yes, somber, but a stabilizing influence, um, particularly relationally after all of the kerfuffle of the days prior. Yeah, th yeah. there's definitely the potential for that. Um one thing though is that Saturn's now in Pisces and not necessarily doing a great job being Saturn and objective. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the Saturn Pisces is pretty waterlogged. Um, you know, it's not that like cut and dried quality from that we've gotten from Saturn for like five years with Saturn and Cap and Aquarius. Um, you know, it's definitely like, you know, it definitely has some some gravity and it's definitely less um. Uh, it's certainly less like fantastical than, you know, uh, Venus square Neptune. Um, but like our, our Saturn, I think is, you know, Saturn is not going to ground us anymore because it's not on the ground. <laughs> you know, fair. It's, that's fair. It's, um, you know, there, there's an emotional weight to Saturn and Pisces that um, isn't uh, that can. Yeah, it, it's just it, it's a different Saturn. And um, I look forward to Venus departing from trying to Saturn. Yeah, mm. that makes a lot of sense. Um, Saturn might not be as helpful um, as it might have been in a trine somewhere else. Yeah, well, okay, so let me yeah. say something nice about the Saturn. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, you don't have to. You can totally no, say no, it. Well, <laughs> no, it comes no. to mind. Don't, um, don't, don't, don't so, give them free rate. Don't tell them to <laughs> only say negative things. No, well, I mean, I, I have a positive thought. Um, so one of the, uh, in my uh, recent rereading of Firmicus and planetary combinations and whatnot, I see a lot of Saturn Venus, especially by trine, um, uh, indicating uh, indicating excellence in aesthetic crafts, right? Creating, you know, an art thing, but not like a fully imaginal thing, but creating something solid. Um, like Firmicus talks about, like Saturn Venus making people who. Um, who are uh, who make uh, who make beautiful textiles and then dye uh, dye things? They're, and with thinking of it, it's like, oh, you will um, uh, like a royal textile dyer. I was like, oh, that's working in fashion, right? Um, but there, you know, this this um, uh, we could say craft, right? Not just art, not just ideas, but craft. Like Saturn anchoring um, Venus's aesthetic, uh, cognitions, uh, into the creation of things that have a weight. Um, and so that, yeah, that, that Saturn, Saturn is useful for sort of disciplining Venus to getting a project done rather than just having a fun, fun idea. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. One of the things I've been trying to understand that gained a greater understanding after like originally reading Firmicus 10 or 15 years ago, and just all the things he says about, venus and saturn aspects and coming to a better understanding of it now it's just oftentimes about what do you do when you run into um, a major difference in a relationship that causes major obstacles for a relationship even if the relationship itself is something you really want and the negotiation of like that which is a deal breaker in a relationship uh, that stops one from happening versus that which can be pushed through uh, to allow a relationship to happen if it's something you really want. Um, and that might be an interesting thing to think about here with Venus trining Saturn on, on this date um, is just the, the ability to push through and identify what is a surmountable difficulty that you can overcome if you really want something to happen as opposed to those things 
that might happen if if it was like a square in opposition or something that might be complete mm -hmm. deal breakers or non-starters for a relationship. Yeah, and Saturn is in uh, the sign of Venus's exaltation, so is willing to work with Venus here. That right. seems like a very tempered expectation. Yeah, seems reasonable. All right, so that's looking good for that. So let's move on. We are firmly in the second week and moving forward now. Um, getting... And this is where it starts getting exciting, is basically yeah. halfway through the month. That Mars, Mars action. Mars starts getting towards the very end of Cancer. And uh, well, with Mercury's and... station before any of this. Okay. Yep. Well, that's nice. Okay, so Mercury stationing May 14th and 15th. It's finally direct at five degrees of Taurus. One of the things that's very nice about that is like immediately after that, the next day by the 16th, Jupiter's ingressed into Taurus. So we're not just getting Mercury stationing direct and the resolution of some of those sort of Mercury retrograde issues that have been going on for the past three weeks up to this point, but also Jupiter moves into that sign where it has that special ability to improve and, and affirm and sort of just like um, smooth things over in whatever the Taurus sector of our chart is and that specific area of our life, whatever house that co coincides with for each of us. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's um. <clears throat> so you know when we talk about uh, Aries, and we talk about a fresh start, and and so this is this is its own kind of fresh start, but it's Taurus, um, because both Mercury is like uh, uh again like gone through the um gone through the purificatory meat grinder of the uh, retrograde has come out the other side freshly arisen uh, in the east, Jupiter freshly arisen in the east and also uh, freshly ingressed into a new sign, right? Like, so like double, <laughs> so fresh and so clean, clean. Um, and that first decan of Taurus, which is ruled by Mercury in one system, um, is very, uh, you see pretty overwhelmingly is about not um, a new idea, but new plans, right? Like, how am I going to do all of this? Like, what is the, what is the process? The, uh, like the go-to metaphor for me is, uh, it, imagine you're a farmer, you've got all this land. What do I plant this season? Right. Is it mm -hmm. going to be, you know, corn over here, you know, serranos over here, you know, whatever, but like, how, what am I going to do with all the, or what am I, what am I going to plant? Um, how am I going to subdivide all of my terrain, um, like, you know, cause you, is it all corn? Is it all jalapenos? Is it all whatever? Um, but that planning and like Mercury, Mercury boosted with Jupiter, um, is really nice here. And, you know, the, the North node can create problems certainly, but it, it, it does give hunger and ambition, um, which I think can work with this combination, like, you know, planning something ambitious, not imagining yourself succeeding at something ambitious but actually planning something right something with that's going to have tangible results and you have a tangible plan for mm -hmm. yeah and i think it's nice too because jupiter is that more expansive wider perspective mercury is more of the details we've got mm -hmm. both of those in the same place working together which is great um my take on rahu being there is is to your point of ambition drive um as long as we're not getting greedy you know, right. as long as we're reading the fine print, not getting ahead of ourselves, um, could be really, really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like that idea of like growth and expansion in the tangible material realm. Um, those are really good, like keywords for Taurus. And it's something I've come to understand much better over the past year, especially after doing the Taurus episode about a year ago in the Zodiac series was just how much Taurus revels in the sort of like earthiness of like a garden, um, but also in just like taking delight in the material pleasures of being in the physical world and all of the good things that come along with that, both in terms of tangible physical things, as well as in terms of um, nature and the appreciation of nature and the sort of like supportive um, role that that can play to each of us, not just physically, but also psychologically. Um, so I'm excited to have Jupiter and Taurus for the next while and how and, that- and I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying, and I just looked it up until May 26th next year, 
Wow. So, so there's a full year. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no regresses back into Aries. Just, um, you know, just uh, slow, steady, reliable Jupiter and Taurus. Let us Good. all go into a forest and walk around, take it in. It's going to be so nice. Good. And so it's really inaugurated here with that moon also ingressing by May 16th and 17th into Taurus. And then a few days later, we get that new moon at 28 degrees of Taurus in that sign. So this full sort of lineup or stellium of planets in Taurus mid to late month. Um, before we have the next shift of of Mars, but just focusing on that Taurus stuff. And, you know, the Mercury retrograde that that was the precursor to that may have um, thrown some things up in the air and caused people to go back and have to re reevaluate certain things about that part of their life in some instances. But it's nice to have this grounding, um, sort of stabilizing set of transits that come in and not just allow things to settle down, but also repair things. Um, one of the things that is often mentioned with Jupiter in some of the ancient texts is allies and having you know friends and allies, but also people that come in and help you and give you a hand when you need it. Uh, and that might be a relevant signification here with Jupiter moving into Taurus at this point is you know the ability of people to reach out and to get help um, if they need help in a certain area of their life might be a good piece of advice or a good keyword to keep in mind with that ingress, both in May as well as just as a longer term transit over the course of the next year. Yeah, that's definitely what I've been telling my clients, like wherever Taurus is in your chart, whatever that signifies for you, when Jupiter gets in there, if you're asking for something and Jupiter is affirmation, they are yes, then that will hopefully be what you find. And then particularly for Saturn's challenges in Pisces, if you're having challenges there in the Pisces part of your chart, where's Saturn going to look for help? Well, now there's actually eyes between them and they can see each other and exchange resources. So that was another really cool point um, about that. For sure. Yeah, that's a great yeah. point is that it's not only a sign change for Jupiter, but the sign change... <clears throat> creates a new and much more favorable angle between Jupiter and Saturn. And clearly, like you just said, like Saturn's in a Jupiter old sign, right? So it's right. very important for uh, Saturn will be less of a dick um, if it has a nice aspect to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. um, and so it makes that makes those challenges easier to was navigate. That, was, that Dorth was that Dortheus? I hear you quoting. I think that was ancient delineation. <laughs> less of a dick yeah, yeah. It, well it was actually <laughs> a medieval La it was the medieval latin translation of okay. dorotheus so there was like um, a, U a u.s like added to the end or something like that yeah, grammatically yeah, yeah. Okay. It, was it was church latin um not koine greek okay. um <laughs> scholarship <laughs> right um well and i think that that's relevant for jupiter and taurus one thing i've i've noticed with a lot of people who i've known who have a prominent jupiter and taurus placement is they love the the accumulated weight of good scholarship that people have done. They're like, oh, there, there's so much, like people have already done so much work. Like, why not enjoy that and let that support your own work? Right. Right. Um, right. The, 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 you know, Jupiter and Taurus makes the, uh, I was going to say, like, it takes knowledge out of the abstract. Be like, well, that um, 10 volume, 1200 page set is full of knowledge. Right? Yeah. It's right there. Um, it's actually hard to carry up the stairs. Let let me avail myself of this almost in the funny, like cliche Taurus, you know, what are the negative stereotypes? That's not necessarily true, but of like almost like laziness. But the here that laziness is just like, you know, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let me take advantage of all this scholarship and all this work that other people have done and put it to good use in that context. Yeah, and uh, it's a Venus full sign. Take pleasure in it. You know, the Jupiter mm. and Taurus people I'm thinking of just really take pleasure in like well done work. Like, ah, it's such a nice job, you know, um, whatever, reviewing the um, fourth century of Rome, <laughs> right? Um, that it's not only a, an asset, right, benefic, but it's also a pleasure. Yeah, and, and also the enjoyment Taurus and like Virgo share this a little bit, especially thinking of Jupiter there, but the, the enjoyment of something that's done really well or done to a high standard, especially of, you know, material or physical things like, um, what is it like bespoke? Is that the keyword for it? Or just that, that, that trend over the past several years of like things 
being done um, in a really nice way or in like small limited batch or like craftsman type things, mm -hmm. like having the ability to do something very well. My most cherished objects that I value the most highly are all the bespoke ones for sure. Mm. The, the uh, yeah, the artisan crafted, whatever. Right. The, so, uh, yeah. So, okay, so those are the good things that I wanted to make sure we mentioned about the Jupiter and Taurus and the positive things that's going to bring. I have to mention, though, the aspects, because there's some tense aspects once it goes in that are tied into this whole picture. First, in that, you know, one of the biggest outer planet configurations this month is that as soon as Jupiter goes into Taurus, it's going to immediately square Pluto, which is still in Aquarius for a little bit longer at this point before it retrogrades out um, of Aquarius and moves back into Capricorn in early June. Um, but also Mars is coming up at this point. It's coming up to the end of Cancer, and it finally ingresses into Leo by May 19th and 20th, at which point it immediately creates an opposition with Pluto as well as a square with Jupiter. And aside from some of the eclipse stuff earlier in the month, we get one of our most really like tense aspects is this aspect, this T-square that occurs between Mars and Jupiter and Pluto around May 20th. Yeah, this felt to me like, um, you know, leading up to this, we've had all this shaky ground with the eclipses and the retrograde. And uh, now things have stabilized a little bit and hopefully we'll be feeling so fresh and so clean, clean, like as you're saying. Uh, but the the image that I got in my mind was like, we've been used to having kind of this like floppy paper plate and not able to put a ton of food on it. I feel like at, by the time we get here to this T-square, we're going to have like this robust stoneware plate and we're going to want to fill it with like a bunch of stuff. But that doesn't mean that we can actually consume all of it eat all of it it's just like eyes bigger than stomach that's my concern with this is just like overextending it's, over and you know, like too much yeah it, it's um uh it's uh how should i say it's very bold yes um the uh you know if it was just mars jupiter um you know mars jupiter is often favorable jupiter often just like reigns in mars just a little bit while also being supportive of assertion and action um, but the, yeah, the, the Pluto, you know, like the, your, your image of the, the, of Macho Man Randy Savage, um, uh, snapping into, uh, Mordor, <laughs> right? Like that, that hell imagery of, uh, of Pluto, right? Like that yeah. the Pluto gives it a weird angle, uh, gives it, um, uh, I, I was, let me just say the, um, if it was Mars, Jupiter or Mars, Pluto alone, very different, right? Mars, Pluto is, you know, is very dark and, um, how should we say turbulent and uh, can, and like um, uh, how should we say uh, doing um, Mars Pluto will bring up power dynamics in like a half shadowy mm -hmm. uncomfortable way and then Mars Jupiter is just raw power enthusiasm right that's the mm -hmm. you know the 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 uh, Randy Savage cutting a promo and so mm -hmm. it's an interesting combination what one thing I will say is that um, I would rather have this with Jupiter as part of it than just the Mars Pluto, right? Oh, just the Mars Pluto is just like dark, broody. And then also with, with Mars being such an extroverted sign, um, you know, prone to explode. Jupiter both supports some of that, like that action and boldness, but tempers it a little bit, but doesn't, does it, does it temper it wholly, right? It's, it's an interesting I, I think this is one that doesn't have to go one way. I think this configuration will be um, kind of a disaster for some people and work out really well for other people. Cause there's, right. there's such a difference between Mars, Pluto and Mars, Jupiter in terms of what kind of results we would expect. Right. Yeah. And I'm thinking to whatever opera, like, let's say Jupiter is like the quintessential opportunity, um, making sure that you feel empowered, whoever you are in pursuing that opportunity versus if you do sniff around and find anything like funky about it, you know, then you can be like, oh, I know astrology. I know Pluto is involved. I'll be careful. Um, but that definitely throws a bit of a interesting dynamic into it. Like so one, that. oh, go ahead. Just those keywords of like power and especially empowerment are really good Mars, Pluto, Jupiter keywords um, in that tension. And that's probably one of the, the major ways to take advantage of that and use it productively around mm -hmm. the, that time is some people 
will able to be able to use it probably for um, extreme forms of empowerment and forward movement, almost to the point of being um, ruthlessness, like a ruthless focus mm -hmm. on one's goals and motivations and objectives, um, you know, almost to the detriment of anything else. And sometimes there can be a useful or, or a positive way in which to manifest that. And other times that ruthlessness can be not good, especially with oppositions that can be, that can sometimes manifest externally as you're trying to move forward with something and be enterprising, but you're having to deal at the same time with extreme levels of pushback and, and a counter um, push from extreme forces that are attempting to uh, get you to do something else or, or, or influence you, you from the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, so that, you know, that Mars Jupiter is sort of boldness and enthusiasm. And then the, the question with Pluto, right, is like Pluto puts forward this um, potentially terrifying challenge, like you're saying, Chris, or environment, like, you know, which I think you you captured, Claire, with Mordor, right? Like that, like the threat of annihilation or whatever. It makes me think of like, um, will you, uh, you'll know the... Um, God, what is the, the 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 fiddle contest with the devil? What's the name of that song? Devil went down to Georgia. Yeah, devil is went that... down to Georgia, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it's a it's a classic, and there's a Primus cover that's great. But instead of that, like <laughs> uh, a pro wrestling match with the devil, right? Uh, it's like, can you super? Are you willing to try to suplex the devil? Will you? Uh, will you bet your soul on it, right? And there's like like the Pluto is like, will you? You know, are you willing to risk what feels like annihilation um, in order to obtain, you know, whatever the glorious end is? Or does that or does that like back you off where you're like, well, I, I mean, I'll sit, I'll, I'll suplex maybe a minor devil, but I don't want to, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't I don't want to face the uh, the king of the underworld. Right. And I think there's a, a what you were mentioning there about like, do I don't I how much do I want to get in? There's like this kind of wobbly shakiness to it. But that also I feel like is echoed by Jupiter being co-present with Uranus. So whatever ways in which we are trying to grow or expand or um, have opportunities with Uranus there, it's like a slightly dangerous opportunity, something out of my comfort zone. Um, so that might be a little highlighted here too. It's just yeah, a little out of comfort zone maybe, which is fine and can be totally awesome in building confidence and feeling empowered is doing something out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. it, so I think, just in the news, we'll see people making big moves that are risky. Yeah. Is that, you think that's a fair statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's even just with like Mars, Pluto, hard aspects in on its own, we often see that. Um, but you put Pluto in the mix, that's just going to amplify that and, and exaggerate it. Yeah. I, I'd also be surprised if this didn't um, mark um, a much more uh vigorous uh season of of fighting in uh in ukraine hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean sense. i just broadly i was thinking like mars pluto opposition is tough because that's already kind of like a, a violent i've already said ruthless but also mars jupiter we've seen in the past can be kind of an explosive combination um but i'm hoping that the sort of tense uh almost like a ruthless or violent quality that the Mars Pluto opposition has I hope that Jupiter is able to come in and play the role of mediator or peace broker and I think we'll see some situations like that where you just have two sides that are just um you know ruthlessly set against each other and unable to find middle ground um, because they're just completely mutually exclusive but then having a third party that comes in in an attempt to find some sort of reconciliation between the two of them um, is one of the those sort of potentials or like broadly positive manifestations I could imagine. Mm -hmm. That'd be nice. Yeah. Um, what else? We, I mean, you know, Jupiter Pluto, I've also talked about how sometimes the use of the manipulation of, of information in order to attempt to get people to do something seemed like a previous recurring theme under hard Jupiter Pluto aspects. So mm -hmm. I would kind of I would I would pay attention to that also as a potential theme with that Jupiter Pluto square. Um, we just we saw a lot of that, um, especially I think in 2020 when we were seeing the conjunctions between Jupiter and Pluto and Capricorn. Definitely. 
All right. So, and that is also, that's, you know, that's the beginning of a, what, like a couple month Mars transit through Leo. So that's just the start of, of a longer term transit, but it just begins kind of explosively. So it's not one of those ones that'll have like a slow buildup or something, but it's just like Mars ingresses and we are, we are right into it. And it's like that, this is what this transit's going to be about. And then a lot of what comes after that is just kind of like dealing with the aftermath of that in some ways. Yeah, well, and it's worth noting that these are all in fixed signs. Um, and so there's a, you know, often when, when fixed signs, uh, fixed signs indicate fixed trajectories, um, not, uh, <clears throat> whereas, um, you know, cardinal signs, like we we're talking about with alligators earlier, it's like a burst of activity. And then I don't know, you know, kind of a lull. Um, and mutable signs give you this um, this sort of doing a thing and then going doing something else and then coming back. Fixed signs, you know, with fixed signs, you get straight lines. Um, and so there's a certainty to the movements that are initiated under fixed sign configurations. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, uh, just for reference, this will probably be, uh, even though the Mars enters a few days earlier, um, when the moon hits Mars in Leo, on the 24th and squares Jupiter and opposes Saturn. That'll, that'll, if, if you can't see it by then, then, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to like me, get your eyes checked. Yeah. And that's a good point too, because like, it's not just one day with this one. I mean, even the Jupiter Mars square is applying and setting itself up before, um, the Jupiter ingress, then Jupiter ingresses, or maybe that's before the Mars ingress. Uh, and then even after that, for a few days, then Mars is separating from all that. And then the moon comes in on the 24th and pings it after all of that. So there's like a 10 day swath of time in the middle of May where all of this middle end, where all of that is going to be happening. Yeah. And, the, and at the same time, we have the Mercury, yeah. Rahu, Jupiter, like the plans, right? There are mm -hmm. plans coming together. There's always a time to act like immediately with certainty. There's a lot of, there's a lot brewing. Yeah. And something also worth mentioning, Mars going into Leo, um, it's going to, um, for some people, it'll be just putting a lot of extra energy and effort, having a burst of energy and a burst of pro productivity in a certain area of your chart or area of your life. Um, for others, though, Mars can sometimes bring up strife or conflict or um, irritations or major setbacks in that area. And one of the things that's going to happen this summer is that Mars is going to go through that sign and then depart somewhat relatively quickly. But then later in the summer, we're going to get that Venus retrograde in Leo, which is going to come in and on the one hand, hopefully smooth over a little bit of the harshness of what just happened with that Mars transit. But on the other hand, for some people, it's also going to put a much more um, extended a period of attention on that sign and on that area of our charts at the same time and bring up some relational stuff with the Venus, but also um, doing some looking back and some retrospective looks at that part of our chart or that part of our lives that the Mars transit itself, which begins this month, might first stir up. Yeah. Yeah. Venus is, um, Venus is following in the wake of Mars. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like uh, like you said earlier, Chris, um, Venus is, you know, right now and for the first part of the month is moving through Gemini, which Mars spent a bunch of time in. And then it moves into Cancer and it's following Mars there. And although the Venus ingress into Leo doesn't happen this month, Venus will follow Mars into Leo and then stop before the con just shy of the conjunction. And so, yeah, this this uh, the, the Mars is a lead in to you know where where mars treads venus will follow for the next bit um i a uh, quick quick side note i just quick looked it up and rod macho man randy savage had jupiter and taurus oh no <laughs> wow <laughs> he is very robust <laughs> yeah. Yeah. all right he is our he is our spirit person our mascot for, for... <laughs> our mascot for this episode so i'm gonna put yeah. him back up on the screen just to that's <laughs> The co the combination that we're talking about, and that's the combination that inspired this image. I think you said was that specific alignment. It was that was what brought him to mind for me, and then I did an AI thing about it. <laughs> okay, oh, I love it. Good. Um, I am 
trying to like quickly generate an image of him with like the planets in the sky. It's not like quite working out, but this is the best I could come up with. He's looks like he's standing Ooh. on on Mars, which is not quite what I was trying to get it to depict, but that's pretty good. Is oh. he smiling in one of them? <laughs> One of them he is. One of them he has a weird frown down here in the bottom right. I don't know what's going on there, but clearly we have more work to do. Yeah, yeah. we're still still tweaking yep. it, but we'll we'll work on this. Yeah, um, see if we can get one with him suplexing the devil on yeah. Mars. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we're now getting into the tail end of the month and final things that we wanted to mention as we get to the very end of the month. What do we what do we got or where are we at at this point? We've kind of got what we talked about, like everything sort of holds. Mercury is moving very slowly. Um, so it never conjoins Jupiter or the North Node, but it's it's right there um, for the rest of the month. And then is starting to get towards Uranus, but it's that Mercury, Rahu, Jupiter, Uranus and Taurus, Mars in early, uh, Mars in early, uh, blah, Mars in early Leo, um, departing from the opposition with Pluto, Venus is still in Cancer. Like we've, you know, like this. This is the shape, right? Uh, yeah. the, the, these bold plans for the future. In some cases, bold action pretty immediately from those. In some cases, daring, uh, seemingly foolhardy or uh, high risk, right? With that that Pluto energy thrown in, a uh, very sweet Venus in. Um, in cancer that feels increasingly um increasingly loving as it moves into a trine with neptune and pisces and and mars is no longer in the same sign yeah that trine starts getting pretty close towards the end of the month and then goes exact in early june between venus and neptune on june 2nd at 27 cancer um i noticed that the sun hits a square with saturn on the 27th and 28th of the month so the sun hits about six degrees of gemini and squares saturn on the sixth and strangely at the same time the moon goes into virgo mm -hmm. and opposes saturn and squares the sun at the same time so we got both of the luminaries in mercury ruled signs um sort of making a hard aspect and creating some tension with that saturn and pisces yeah i was wondering about about this one here this this little t-square um that caught my eye too and thinking about the fact that we just had that new moon at the very end of taurus then the sun enters gemini and then this is that first quarter moon of that lunation cycle and usually the first quarter moon is that you know first square first little need for adjustment in the month um the moons but then that opposition with saturn is just emphasizing that that point of tension even more like uh let's just say you start a plan in taurus this is like the first maybe little speed bump um oh you gotta you gotta take care of this first before uh passing uh collecting 200 dollars, passing go all of that yeah for sure well the, and yeah. it reminds me it's like this is the first time because gemini and you know gemini season with the sun and gemini is usually such a light social energy mm -hmm. but this reminds me this is the first time you know we'll have a gemini season where saturn is kind of overseeing it and putting a bit of a damper on things by squaring that sun and forcing there to be um, a little bit more seriousness and a little bit more reservation to some of the mutable signs than we would see in a in a normal year or in an average year where Saturn has previously been just doing that to the fixed signs. Um, so having that sun square, I think will be a really interesting sort of initial insight into that and what transits through Gemini are going to be as we move through um, the next couple of years and, and as Mercury eventually gets into Gemini next month. Yeah, it makes uh, it makes the sun's time in Gemini, especially that early part, more dutiful, more obligated, more mandatory, um, more emotionally heavy than they would be otherwise, you know, which, you know, may not ruin or destroy what's what you know what you're doing but there's just a little there's a little additional weight it's a little more serious than maybe you were hoping for you know you have yeah. less free time than you were hoping for well and especially with that moon hitting the opposition with saturn at the same time from virgo uh virgo and saturn both share that quality of discernment but also being able to see the errors in things like errors being really obvious and so um, having that function of being able to see like the problems with something mm -hmm. starting to arise, but then that being sometimes a good thing that can be used constructively because once you've identified mm -hmm. a problem or something that's out of place, you can 
pull it out, you know, get rid of that thing, hopefully, or at least start working towards that in order to, um, you know, make things run more smoothly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, on that point, uh, when Saturn went into Pisces, that was something I was kind of wondering about myself was just the, the, the monthly lunar opposition with Saturn every month, the moon opposes Saturn historically or the last several years, we've been having it across Aquarius and Leo, which is just so different. There's not a lot of affinity one way or the other. Um, you know, just in a qualitative sense, like Leo sun, very expressive and outgoing, um, Aquarius, very objective, um, separate, but then it doesn't seem, and I don't want to dismiss like for anyone who has, uh, placements in Pisces or Virgo. I don't want to dismiss the difficulty of having like Saturn there and then having that lunar opposition across that every month. But like there is a, a qualitative affinity between that, like Chris said, the discernment of Virgo and Saturn also being this discerning, you know, both having kind of high standards, but in the name of quality. Um, and that might, you know, that might be kind of a, a constructive thing, which I don't feel like we had when Saturn was in Aquarius. Yeah. Well, that especially in Pisces, because that Saturn tendency, or even sometimes, especially the Saturn tendency, but sometimes the Virgo tendency of criticalness mm -hmm. can be experienced by other people like externally, but especially Saturn and Pisces, I can see that that energy being turned internally as well. And just being like, um, very aware of one's faults and one's defects, right. the areas where you, you, you have problems that you need to work on, but mm -hmm. the identify identification of that is the first step towards, you know, moving towards improvement and self-improvement, yeah. especially on an, an internal level. Yeah. You got to see the realistic thing, Saturn, you have to see what is really there. And then with acceptance, Pisces, like we can maybe move forward. Um, and then to that point of, uh, like Valen said, Saturn was self-deprecating and hypercritical and, you know, pointing that inward that can be helpful, but staying in the middle of the road with that one, not going to the ditch on either side of like, then, oh, just self-loathing, you know, we don't want it to go there necessarily. Right. For sure. Yeah. Um, all right. And then immediately after that, um, Becky in the chat reminds me, I meant to mention our auspicious election for this month, which actually does fall towards the end of the month once we get out away from some of those first eclipse season and then those hard aspects, the exact ones at least with Mars and Pluto and everything. So the auspicious election for this month um, that we picked out is set for May 30th, 2023 around 2.45 p.m. local time. So set the chart for around 2.45 p.m. Um, locally in your own time, and then adjust the ascendant until the ascendant is in early Libra. So what you'll end up with is a chart with Libra rising, and the ruler of the ascendant is Venus, which is up there at 24 degrees of Cancer in some of those later degrees of Cancer that Austin was mentioning earlier, where Venus is in pretty good shape at this point in the month and is moving uh, away from the sextile with Uranus at 20 degrees of Taurus. And it's moving towards that somewhat flowing trine with Neptune at 27 degrees of Pisces. So Venus is the ruler of the Ascendant. It's up in the 10th house of career, public reputation, and overall life direction, uh, doing a pretty good job and being pretty productive. It has some zodiacal strength and dignity because it's actually exchanging signs in a mutual reception with the moon, which is at 15 degrees of Libra, and the moon is in the first house and applying to a square with reception with Venus. So there's an interchange between the ruler of the first house and the ruler of the 10th house of career, which is tying together, but also strengthening both of those areas of the chart. Um, Let's see what else is going here. We're we're well out of the Mercury retrograde. One of the things I would recommend doing if you can in your location is try to pick any degree of Libra rising, but try to get the degree of the midheaven if you can in your location to be about three or four degrees of Cancer. Because if you do that, you'll get a nice sextile um, with Jupiter and you'll get a nice trine with Saturn, which is going to help mitigate the eighth house position of Jupiter and make it a little bit more constructive. And it's also going to mitigate um, the sixth house placement of Saturn at six degrees of Pisces and make that a little bit more constructive at the same time. So I think this is a really good chart for 10th house matters pertaining to career, reputation, the public, overall life direction, and things like that because of the ruler of the Ascendant being in the 10th house. 
Um, <clears throat> it's not as good of a chart for uh, 11th house matters pertaining to friends and groups and alliances because it has Mars in the 11th house in a day chart. So if your election or what you're starting at this time is mainly focused on friends and groups, it might not be great for that. Um, although there is a little bit of mitigation coming from Jupiter, which is overcoming Mars at this point, and that aspect is separating. So that is the monthly election for the, the month, or at least that's the best electional chart that Lisa and I were able to find. And we actually have picked out three or four other charts this month that we're about to record for our Auspicious Elections podcast, which is available to patrons, where we go through each month and we pick out the four or five most auspicious dates that we can for the month ahead. So you can find out more information about that podcast and get access to it at theastrologypodcast.com slash elections. All right. And that kind of brings us to the very, very end of the month at this point. I think we've actually covered a surprising amount. We've covered just about everything. Um, let me put get this archetypal explorer.com transit timeline up that just shows a visual graphic of all the major transits this month, both the major ones as well as the minor ones. And it looks like we've covered just about all of them, I think, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it only took us two and a half hours. Yeah. I think yeah. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Hey, I just, I just released a five and a half hour podcast episode. So thank you better thank your lucky stars that I did not turn this into one of those. And we were able to get this, uh, this month ahead forecast out in a meager two hours and 25 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, you smile grimacingly slightly. All right. Oh, I, I'm just having um, I'm just having flashbacks to recording the yearly, oh, yeah. um, where I think I don't know what the recording time was, but I, as far as sitting in the chair time, I think it was around seven hours. It's a full yeah, day. That, that was grueling. That was more. That was more than a full day, even though it doesn't sound oh, like. Yeah. It's like more. Most normal people think that sounds as like you know, so, so what, like everybody does like an eight hour day work day and most of the time, but like talking for that long. And, mm. um, I think the way you explained it to me, Austin recently was like, you're using so much like brain computing power to be on for that long. And also to be like thinking and trying to say things, uh, and pull up all those memories that you're actually, your like mind computer is actually running much more than you would think it is sort of like those studies of like how many calories a chess grandmaster mm. burns like while they're playing chess ends up being like surprisingly high mm. yeah well because you're not just talking for six hours you're trying to talk as well as possible while thinking um thinking your very best thoughts and then trying to offer that in a way that is um you know engaging or socially acceptable or whatever right well, yeah well well, I'm glad to have the ability to do that and sometimes to do those longer episodes because we're able to do sort of like if we were to do a, a day long or a weekend workshop on a topic and just say everything that we you know, know or wanted to say about that topic, that's sort of the ability the podcast has afforded me uh, and us over the years. So it's been really cool developing that and having this platform. And I wanted to thank everybody, both in the live chat, all the patrons that joined us today and gave us some comments because it's been some actually really useful stuff that's actually informed and helped um, change the scope of the discussion. And thanks to all the listeners as well that listen and, and support the podcast every month because they make it possible. Um, thank you both for joining me today. Thanks, Claire, for joining us. This was yes. great. You did an amazing job. It was great having you on the forecast. Um, what do you got going on in the future? Where can people find out more information about you? Yeah, thank you. This has been an honor. I'm very delighted to be here. Uh, what do I got going on? I am on a website, www.aligninglightastrology.com. I am, books are wide open all the time. Um, I am doing a couple offerings on YouTube every month. I do a, my own forecast at the end of every month live on YouTube. I also do like more of a student focused Q and A, um, just general astrology chat, chat time, um, it's like, what is it? The second Thursday of every month, 7 p.m. Central time over on YouTube. Um, other than that, I am doing kind of personal exploration research um, based on a technique that I got from Ancient Astrology Volume 1 from Demetra George called The Moon Under Bond. Uh, there, there's an offering on my website for a research consultation. If anyone's interested in that, I need help. I need people. Um, so if you want to help me demonstrate that technique, that would be great. Um, but yeah, I think that's about it. Awesome. And yeah, your YouTube channel is youtube.com slash aligning light astrology, all one word, right? Correct. Yep. 
Cool. All right. And I'll put a link to that in the description below the video or on this description page on the podcast website. Uh, how about you, Austin? I guess your main thing is you got that big conference coming up. Yeah, for me, um, yeah, I'll be doing the pre-conference workshop at Norwac on planetary trios. And I have a lecture on the natural years of the planets and then a lecture on um, the lot of the father as applied to the charts of the Menendez brothers. Um, who quite famously murdered their father. Um, and it's it's a sordid tale that the astrology tells beautifully. Um, but much more interesting than any of that um, is Sphere and Sundry is um, due to announce on May 23rd um, what is uh, the, what I've referred to as the Manhattan Project, which is clearly a magnum opus. This is a project Kate has been working on actively since 2018 um and it's finally going to be announced and it's i can't i can't give any uh any details about it yet um but uh it's fucking fantastic and it's sort of new high water mark for uh astrological magic so that's coming on the 23rd nice so people can sign up for the sphere and sundry newsletter for that at sphere and sundry.com is that the best way or, or or their social media they probably should, or they could just keep the window open and feverishly refresh. There's actually a right. countdown timer uh, on the website now. Oh, nice. Okay. I like that. So you can just watch until until it happens, until the mystery is revealed. Yeah. And love Magnum that. Opus, Magnum Oppenheimer. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love how the the Oppenheimer and that movie is coming out on Oppenheimer this like summer um, so it's, that's funny that this has been like a recurring theme, uh, for us in this episode. Yeah. 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 Well, they, hopefully they this episode is the bomb, Chris. Yeah, exactly. Austin. All right. Well, I'll put a link <laughs> to your website in the bottom, in the description page for this episode. It's austincopic.com and, uh, sphere and sundry.com. Um, as for myself, I'm going to get, just keep doing the podcast. That's going to be my focus and continue, doing research and episodes. I'm hoping to do an episode on Heliodora soon and uh, also working on an episode on an ancient astrologer. And yeah, so basically just going to keep doing these great workshops on the podcast. And if you want to support that work or if you listen to the podcast frequently and you'd like to uh, give something back, you can sign up for my Patreon at patreon.com slash astrology podcast and get access to early access to new episodes or other subscriber benefits. Uh, like exclusive podcast episodes. So that's it for this forecast. Thanks everyone for watching or listening, and we'll see you again next month. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean-Marie Kaplan. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through our page on patreon.com. In exchange, you can get access to bonus content that's only available to patrons of the podcast, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the monthly forecast episodes, our monthly Auspicious Elections podcast, or another exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast, or you can even get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, visit patreon.com slash astrology podcast. If you're looking to get an astrological consultation, we have a list of recommended astrologers at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrologers on the list are friends of the podcast that have been featured in different episodes over the years, and they have different specialties such as natal astrology, electional astrology, synastry, rectification, or horary astrology. You can get a 10% discount when you book a consultation with one of the astrologers on our list by using the promo code ASTROLOGYPODCAST. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. 
If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune, where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. Thanks also to the Starscribe Astrology and Journaling app, which is currently running a Kickstarter campaign through April 22nd, 2023, to fund an exciting new mobile app for astrologers. Find out more information at starscribe.co. Finally, thanks also to the Northwest Astrology Conference, which is happening May 25th through the 29th, 2023, just outside of Seattle. This year's conference is going to be a hybrid conference where you can either attend online or in person. Find out more information at norwac.net.